2015. My name is John Michael. I work with the Metro Codes Department and will be presenting each of the cases today for the board's consideration. Uh, we would ask at this time for everyone in the audience, would you please silence your phones, and please silence your tablets or any other uh, electronic devices you have just so that the board's proceedings and specifically the hearings won't be interrupted. And actually, we thank you in advance for your help with that. In each of today's public hearings, the board actually reviews correspondence that's been submitted whether in support of or opposition to each of the cases. The board also reviews the correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies applicable to each case. And in the hearings, the staff will present site plans, the maps, the photographs, and any other documents that comprise the case record before the board. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, each appellant will then present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, any of those in the audience who wish to speak in support of the appeal will have the opportunity to come forward and do so. If the appeal has opposition, then the board would then hear from those parties. Upon completion of any opposition presentation, the appellant will have an opportunity to present rebuttal testimony before the board. Under BZA rules, the appellant has 10 minutes for presentation if there's no opposition. On contested cases, BZA rules allow for 15 minutes to each side for presentation of testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, that appellant should reserve some portion of the originally allotted 15 minutes. It should be noted for any who are here in groups, that's a 15 minutes shared time. So, divvy up your time in advance in order to make sure that nobody gets left out that wanted to participate. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on each case. The board best, is vested with the power to do so under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17.40.180. All of the section numbers that we refer to today come from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council on January 1st, 1998, and I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record for each of the cases. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings because BZA meetings are recorded uh, for public access television. It's imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward and speak into the microphones at the front of the room. Any such speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make the desired presentation. The Metro Code also requires four of our seven board members in order to establish quorum. The code requires four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that only four members are present and the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, that appeal will be re-advertised for the next available public hearing. In the event that five or more board members are present and the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within that timeline shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, aggrieved parties may file a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date, pursuant to the terms of the Board of Zoning Appeals rules and regulations. After that time elapses, the board's action becomes final and no further action can be taken. For the appellants, please take note. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for a board's approval to remain valid. Otherwise, projects must come back to the codes department to apply for the permit, file an application to get before the Board of Zoning Appeals, and have a new hearing accordingly. It should also be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. There are uh, preliminary announcements for the board regarding today's docket. First, there are two cases that have been withdrawn from today's docket. The first, case 2017-276, involving the property at 910 Granada Avenue in Council District Number 5. And the next is case 2017-288, involving the property at 422 North 16th Street in Council District Number 6. Both of those cases have been withdrawn. Then there are a number of cases that have been deferred from today's docket. That was the... Gr
Enjoy your preacher. next four hours. Mr. Chairman, my father, the preacher, used to say when you got him saying amen, you should sit down, but I'm not in a position to do that today. <laughs> there is one other case that was marked for withdrawal, and that's case number 2017-199 involving the property at 3535 Hermitage Industrial Drive. That case, too, will be withdrawn. Then the list of deferred cases. The first is case 2017-178 from Council District number 24. That case is deferred to November the 2nd. Next, case 2017-246 in Council District number 14. The property at 300 Stewart's Ferry Pike, that too will be deferred to November the 2nd. Next is case 2017-259 involving the property at 1322 Sixth Avenue North in the Germantown neighborhood, Council District number 19, deferred two meetings to D uh, November the 16th. Next, case 2017-270, involving the property at 3501 Murfreesboro Pike in Council District number 32, deferred to November 2nd. And finally, case number 2017-274, involving the property at 2926 Foster Creighton Drive in Council District number 16. That matter has been deferred to November the 2nd. With all of those deferrals and the withdrawals, it's a slimmer docket, but nevertheless a number of cases to hear. Mr. Chairman, we are joined by a number of our Metro Council members here to address the board today. As always, we'll give them the opportunity to address the board if they wish at this point at the outset of the meeting. Uh, first, I know I saw Council Member Karen Johnson. Council Member Johnson, do you wish to address the board at this time? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ewing, uh, esteemed board members. I'm Karen Johnson, representing District 29. I am here to speak on uh, case 2017-299. Um, this person is um, asking for a variance from sidewalk requirements uh, to build a two-floor uh, two storage building. Um, I have concerns as the council representative for the area because we have worked incredibly hard to ensure that we are building sidewalks with every project. I'm not aware of any topography, slope issues, or uh, anything that would create a need to not um, go forth with uh, the requirement for a sidewalk. So therefore, I am asking that um, this request be denied and that this applicant get with me as the council member because I have to be able to convey um, appropriate information to my constituents whenever there is um, a sidewalk that does not go in um, given the recent legislation that we have done um, in the council. So I respectfully ask for um, this particular request at this time to be denied and um, because as council members, we feel that sidewalks are incredibly important, especially in Southeast Nashville where there's a lack of them. Any questions for Council Lady Johnson? I, I do. Um, was it case 299? Mm-hmm. Okay, I had in my notes that, um, and we could look this up, is that the applicant was going to build a sidewalk, but with a different plan, so they were still gonna build a sidewalk. Would that change anything? I, I think that they need to meet um, the sidewalk requirements unless they can, I, they need to speak with the council member, first of all. I mean, be, me being here and not being aware of what the hardship is uh, for the request, I think is a problem in and of itself. Um, but with us passing the most recent legislation at the council and with the lack of sidewalks, especially in Antioch, Southeast Nashville, I'm not knowledgeable of what those hardships are. So I would say to deny that request as a result. From what I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for speaking out for sidewalks. Um, I personally appreciate it. Um, I think that they met with plan the planning department and that was the planning department's recommendation just to give you some of the background, but maybe um, John Michael can fill us in a little more. 
The request is not to build, is not to refrain from building sidewalks, but instead to take the sidewalks that are already in place, use a modified or alternative design plan in order to deal with the fact that there is a retaining wall at the subject property, which I can show you in one moment. Okay. Based upon my recent site visit to the council member's district and what I saw in the field. Now, the board will have the determination as to whether to grant that variance or not, but just so you can at least address the question as to what's in the field and what the basis for the request was. Uh, board members, you also, of course, have in your packet the letter that was submitted and has been public record for more than two weeks now, available to anyone who needed to see a copy, uh, outlining what they believe to be their variance. This is an aerial view of the subject property. This is the site plan that was submitted. From my recent site visit, the face of the property, you can see the wall in place and sloping down from the sidewalk into the parking area. And then finally, the view up and down Murfreesboro Pike there and the lower portions, the view directly across the street in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, happy to provide other information if I can, members of the board. Okay, so where is the variance being, I mean, what is it that not, where is the sidewalk not going to go? Council mm -hmm. members, you know this is not my appeal to the mm -hmm. Board of Zoning Appeals, but the appellant's appeal, so they okay. will probably be in the best position to explain their case. Okay. And John Michael, I think since the council person objects, we should hear this case and it's regularly scheduled mm -hmm. place. Thank you. I also want to speak on um, case 2017-281. This is a case of a notice requirement to a senior citizen um, in regards to this particular case. And so I want to stress that um, because there was one mailing that the um, senior citizen did not receive in regards to this particular um, renewal, I think that there should be um, uh, exceptions made uh, when we have senior citizens who rely heavily upon being communicated with um, more than once uh, with a notice. So I do support um, uh, the, the appeal on this for this particular case, and uh, I thank you for your time. Okay, duly noted. Is there any other questions for Council Lady Johnson? And my one kind of words of advice for those watching at home or even watching here, if you come in front of this board, you're asking for a variance or a special exception or something, we have 35 district council people. They knocked on thousands of doors to get elected. They go to Tuesday night meetings twice a month. If you come in front of this board and have not communicated with your council person, usually that is not a very good thing. And when the council person shows up and says, I haven't even heard from the applicant, either by email, phone, or whatever. Um, it's always good to call, contact your council person, especially when it's in front of this board, planning, or anything else. John Michael. We're also joined by Council Member Brett Withers from District Number 6. Councilman Withers, do you wish to address the board? Thank you so much, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals. I regret that my work schedule doesn't permit me to stay this time, uh, as I did last time, to uh, enjoy your deliberations. So uh, I do need to get back to work today, and I apologize for that, but wanted to provide brief comments on a few matters and a little bit more extensive comments on another. Um, the brief ones first are cases 273. This is a short-term rental. Um, uh, I have not been contacted by this particular applicant, which is fine. Um, the only thing that I would note on this particular case is that um, this is a case for which uh, some neighbors have contacted me uh, with some concerns about the property, and um, these aren't, you know, we do have constituents that frequently uh, have opinions on one side or another on this particular topic, and this uh, sort of extends to other neighbors. I don't have a lot of specific evidence to cite in this case or, or specific details from them, but that is noteworthy to me that I've received an unusual amount of uh, neighbor correspondence regarding that particular case. Do you have an opinion on it, or how has the correspondence been on this particular case? The correspondence has been, um, uh, when, I, when I've sort of reached back to folks to get uh, detail about what their specific concern is, it's been they've expressed a fear of retaliation and uh, based on a fear of retaliation, they've indicated that they didn't want to give further detail. As far as I can tell, this is a fairly cut and dry case uh, of uh, a person operating perhaps without a permit and 
I got noticed. I, I'm aware that their codes inspectors uh, did visit the site. So as far as I can tell, it's a cut and, fairly cut and dry case, but it's unusual to me to have the, that level of but neighborhood feedback. You know, there's only one review on, I mean, it, there's only one review in the web for it, so it didn't seem like it had a whole lot of activity. Right. So that I would agree. It's just, I'm just sharing that, 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 that it's a little bit unusual um, from, in, in the fact that I'm, I'm hearing feedback from folks that I don't often hear, hear from. Could you tell us the feedback, was it about noise complaints or is it just the fact that they don't have a permit? Uh, operating illegally without a permit. Um, and again, I, they're here today. I, uh, I'm sure you'll hear all the evidence. Codes inspectors did look at the site. As far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it is owner occupied, um, and the folks are trying to get back into compliance. So that would seem to be cut and dry. Um, the next case in six um, is case number 278. This is for property located at 713 New Hall Drive in the Rosebank community. This uh, property owner did reach out to me at least early on. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, confusion surrounding Metro Council legislation. Uh, just to be clear, this, this one also appears to be owner occupied, a person possibly operating without a permit trying to come into compliance. It is owner occupied as such. Bill 608 would not have uh, any impact on this particular property property per se. So uh, again, I, I know that the property owner or, or operator you know, has some concerns, which is fine, but um, I, it would seem to be a, a fairly typical case that y'all would hear. So I don't, beyond that, I don't have any additional information to share, and I'll be happy to follow up with that operator afterward. Um, I also have a sidewalk variance case, which is... Uh, case 2017-297 for a building, uh, actually for an existing building uh, that is being uh, rehabbed and renovated uh, and it's, it's a sidewalk variance and the planning department has looked at it, made a recommendation of approval as long as additional uh, right of way is recorded and it's my understanding that the appellant has agreed to record that additional right of way as well as pay in lieu fees and if uh, they're fine with that, I'm fine with that. And, It'll be great to get uh, a tenant in that building finally because it's been vacant or underutilized for a while. So those are my relatively brief items if you have any additional questions for me. Um, otherwise, the, um, the case that we, uh, many of us were here for uh, during, at the last meeting was deferred to this meeting, which is fine, and that is case number uh, 265 for property located at 96 North 8th Street. Um, I will sort of revisit the uh, meeting that uh, we had at the ad hoc affordable housing, or I'm sorry, ad hoc short-term rental committee uh, where many of you were present. And, you know, one of the things that, that some of you mentioned is that, you know, we, we need enforcement and there's a, uh, an argument to be made in many cases that, well, why don't you just enforce the rules? Well, enforcement is more difficult uh, than uh, many people would imagine. And of course, the Metro Council writes legislation, but we don't have enforcement authority. We have to rely on another body to actually enforce that. And in this particular case, that body is you. So uh, the, the body that, that can potentially enforce the rules uh, is you. And we will be uh, really interested in the committee in, in reviewing what your deliberations are like and what your final decision is um, either way. But this particular this particular case in, involves what I guess I would call uh, adult material that was placed in a window in a very publicly visible place that I observed driving home on a Friday evening and was a little bit uh, nonplussed by that. Uh, that type of incident is not actually all that uncommon uh, in East Nashville, but people don't necessarily know, uh, a lot of folks aren't necessarily comfortable reporting complaints at short-term rentals, period, uh, much less that one. Um, and But I just wanted to give a little bit of, of a background on some of the feedback that I received from neighbors at with other properties surrounding my, my post that I made uh, encouraging folks to report these incidents to codes. So a, a constituent who lives next to a different property says, I know you're so tired of the short-term rental issues, so I'm sorry to bother you, but I have a question regarding making reports to codes. And then they're referencing my post, uh, encouraging folks to report these to codes so that some of these behaviors could be recorded as a strike against the permit. For these particular neighbors, they said, over the summer, we've had multiple issues with the property next door to us, including the following. Multiple instances of inflatable genitalia displayed outside the property. One instance of guests waving 
becoming inflatable at my spouse and making derogatory comments, guests vomiting in the front yard. Last night, the girls came home at 1 a.m. yelling and shouting profanity at each other during the 15 minutes it took them to enter the house. We have brought these issues to the owner's attention. To her credit, she has indicated that she has posted house rules, which many people do. That doesn't mean that they're enforced, and intends to charge people fines for this kind of behavior. However, the behavior continues. Um, the person writing and her husband indicate that they have not made any complaints to codes or any other official body. Our experience with a separate issue was that multiple complaints to codes resulted in no action of any kind. I think many of our complaints did not even get properly logged. My question to you is if we should be reporting these issues and if we can reasonably expect any sort of result from that reporting or if it would continue to be an exercise in futility. Um, thank you for your time and thoughtful attention to this uh, issue. So this, this is the type of behavior that many neighbors in for certain of the quote unquote problem properties live with for a long period of time. Don't have a lot of confidence that either A, it can be reported, or B, that if it is reported, it will be dealt with. Um, and that leads neighbors not to report the issues, which again goes back to why are there so few complaints? A lot of people don't actually feel as though it will result in any action. So we're back before this body. Um, this particular complex of buildings has been a subject of constituent feedback and complaints about lewd behavior and some of those things over a period of time. And in this particular case, I happen to drive by and very, very plainly visibly see uh, something that was potentially disturbing uh, and took a photo of that and sent it over to codes and requested that this be counted as a strike. We, have, we do have a three strikes rule and all I'm asking is that this count as one strike. That's all that I'm asking. Um, there is some dispute about what section of the code should be applied to it. Councilmember Berkeley Allen, who is the author of the original short-term rental ordinance and many of the other ones, um, actually cites a different section of the code than I think what the code staff did, but that would be section of the code 11. Dot 12, dot 060A, which says that you know no person who manages or controls a building um, shall allow a bunch of things to take place, including the exhibition or possession of any obscene material or any obscene conduct or entertainment, quarreling, fighting, rowdiness, or loud noise sufficient to contribute a breach of the peace. Um, obviously, everyone has a right to due process, and I understand that the attorney for those property owners is here. Uh, I respect that process. Uh, I guess what I will posit back to this this body is that when we do have evidence of something that clearly is disturbing, at least to some neighbors, um, what does it take to report that? What is the proper body to report it through? And when it comes before you or a court, is this something that could be recorded as a strike? And again, um, all, all we're saying is if we have a three strikes rule, this probably should be one of them. And at some point in time, if these operators cannot control their guests, they may lose their privileges. Uh, Short-term rental permit is a privilege, uh, and like a lot of privileges that are given, you know, there are conditions that are applied to that, and if you do not uh, abide by the standards of that, you could lose those privileges. I'm not saying revoke the permit today. I'm just saying, can neighbors reasonably expect that behavior of this level will count as one strike out of three if they're willing to document it, if they're, if they're willing to overcome their fear of retaliation, if they're willing to come to a hearing and take off work and get babysitters and come to these hearings and multiple times just to get one strike applied. Is, is that grounds to give just one strike? And if so, that may give hope to the argument that we can simply enforce the rules. And if not, that will probably bolster the argument that these permits need to uh, cease, period. So that is what I present to you. Whatever your decision is today and your deliberations is going to be really instructive. I think that this board has not heard a lot of these strike cases yet. So this is going to be a test case and we're all going to learn from it. But it will be really instructive to the ad hoc committee on short term rentals as we continue to, as that body which I join, um, deliber deliberates on a potential uh, new bill. Uh, so just welcome any questions that you have or any comments before I need to head back to work. Well, th this is the first that I can recall of the any kind of hearing about a strike. Um, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. You, the, there are, I guess, two ordinances or two statutes that, that uh, have been presented to us, um, one from Berkeley Allen and one from the appellant. And, and, and it seems like one kind of relates to uh, adult entertainment businesses and, and uh, human uh, expo exposure of, of a human being. Uh, but the one that you uh, describe is the one that you think is relevant to this case and it just is is saying general obscenity and that's what you personally witnessed and is here about is that 
That's correct. I mean, uh, whether or not this particular uh, operation of a type two or a type three in commercial zoning, I, there is debate about whether that is an inherently commercial use, which we are deliberating a lot on the council um, to the extent that these units sometimes are used for bachelor or bachelorette parties that has any number of activities going on inside or outside of the property and whether or not that actually constitutes it as an adult entertainment business is also a matter that is uh, somewhat debated. But I am more of the mind of uh, following along with Councilmember Allen and her original thought that, you know, basically if you disturb the peace and consistently bother the neighbors, that the neighbors need to have some way of reporting that that has some sort of a consequence for the permit ultimately to where we all understand things happen one time, you're not there, but if this pattern of behavior continues, at some point you could lose your permit if you don't institute better monitoring practices. I have a question and I'm trying to catch up. I'm like you, I just came from a work meeting. I know you have to get back to work. Um, and so I just wanna make sure I understood um, that letter that you wrote, that you read to us, that a constituent wrote to you, was that regarding this property or another property? That's a great question. That letter in particular just referenced, you know, I had made a social media post encouraging people to report these behaviors and indicating that I'm going to start doing that when I see particularly obnoxious behavior. So they were relating the type of behavior that they live with next to uh, houses that sometimes display adult materials on the outside, they were, I, I did that more for context of saying this is what neighbors deal with on a regular basis because neighbors feel that there is no reporting or, uh, or consequence for that behavior, they are disinclined to report it. And again, that, that is why I, I'm frustrated by that where I've heard that a number of times from constituents in the past. I'm very frustrated, I, I'm willing to test the system to say, well, let's report it and see how the, the, the uh, body that actually can enforce the rules does. And so I, I just placed that for context that for neighbors that live next to that, um, that that's, a really, that's a real quality of life concern. It may or may not be illegal, but it does uh, lead into apprehension about uh, short-term rentals and particularly type two short-term rentals. And this case is here today because you reported it to Metro Codes, is that right? I reported it to Metro Codes and requested that this uh, action be, be logged as one strike out of the three, yes. So uh, the strikes are, since the license have to be uh, applied for or renewed annually, do the strikes go for the length of the year or is it for so long as that person holds the permit? Or does it go with the property? That's a really good question, and unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that particular Let's question. Let's ask John Michael, so strikes, um, how long do they last? Do they go away, you get reset? Three in a one year window results in revocation of a short term rental permit, so it's a one year window that's applicable. So every year you go back to zero strikes? Presumably that'd be correct, yes sir. Okay. Based on this case, Councilman Withers, um, what's your message for people that have short term rentals in your district and what is going on in your district different than others that causes you, causes this to happen? Well, the main thing that's different about my district than others is that most council districts only have a, a small number of these, uh, a handful of districts have a large number of these. And so, um, you, uh, up until recently, I had the most number of, uh, of short-term rentals in District 6 and have recently been surpassed by District 19. The main thing that I, I really want to say to um, short-term rental owners is I often hear from short-term rental owners who saying that they're good hosts, and they are, in many cases they are. Uh, I, don't, I don't dispute that. Um, the reality is that when you give someone control of your property and you're, not, and you're not there and don't have anyone there to supervise it, who knows what could happen? That's true anytime you allow a stranger into your home. Um, and that has consequences, not just for you as the property owner, but also for the neighbors. And so um, I would really strongly encourage um, those who uh, operate uh, short-term rentals, permitted, properly permitted, to always really keep a close eye on their properties as much as they can. Uh, in some cases, one can live a couple blocks away and this, this behavior can already be going on. And as, as someone said at a recent uh, ad hoc committee meeting, there are some things that one cannot unsee. So uh, I'm not saying that if something happens one time that we're gonna revoke your permit, but there needs to be a consequence of that behavior um, for, for your permit that uh, if you continue to have parties or if you continue to have guests that are unruly and don't monitor them, at some point in time that 
uh, permit is going to be revoked. And so I, I need to put that onus on those owners that you are responsible for the behavior of your guests. Any other questions for Councilman Withers? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. John Michael. We're also joined by Councilman Nick Leonardo from Council District Number One. Councilman, you wish to address the board? Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Nick Leonardo from District One, and I was here to speak on a couple of uh, agenda items, but they appear to be on consent, and so I'm just going to reserve and see if they remain on consent. And I just want to thank you guys for your service to the city. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, barring any late arrivals, I believe that's all of the elected officials who have joined us at this time, and therefore we'll move on to our consent agenda. For the members of the audience, our board utilizes a consent agenda with each of its BZA meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies cases where appellants met the criteria for their requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts, then that case is recommended to the board for its approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended today. And if anyone is here in opposition to any of the cases identified for consent agenda, please raise your hand. The case will be removed from consent agenda and then just heard in its regular order. Let me get my... The cases identified for the consent agenda are as follows. Case 2017-241, involving the property at 804 Cerrito Landing, a variance from setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 241? I see none. The next case is case 2017-260, Anthony Eubanks, the appellant for Joe Bond, the owner of the property at 4268 Kings Lane, the variance from sidewalk requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 260? Seeing none, the next case identified for the consent agenda is 2017-275. Bill Nashville, the appellant and owner of the properties located at 2720 and 2718 Delaware Avenue, requests for a variance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 275? I see none. The next case is 2017-277. Sergei Novitsky, the appellant and owner of the property at 3401 Dakota Avenue, a variance request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 277? The next case identified for consent agenda is 2017-291. Hastings is that Architecture. 281 or 91? Beg your pardon? 291 or 81? Uh, I'm thinking in the sequ sequence originally a lot okay. there, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, case 2017-291 involving the property at the intersection of Vanderbilt Place or 25th Avenue and West End Avenue, owner of Vanderbilt University, Hastings Architecture, the appellant. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 291? Seeing none, the next case is 2017-294 involving the property at 823 Horner Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 294? Very well, that will be removed from consent agenda and heard in its regular order. The next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2017-296. Land Development Group, the appellant on behalf of Mac LLC, owner of the property at 147 Rains Avenue and its variance request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 296? Members of the board, it should be noted that that recommendation for um, consent agenda is contingent upon the agreement between the appellant and the planning department to follow planning department's recommended conditions for approval. Similarly situated is case number 2017-297, represented by the Baker Donaldson Law Firm. Brian Jernigan, the owner of the property at 811 Gallatin Avenue in Council District Number 6, the request for a variance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 297? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, again, we will note that with case 297, that recommendation for consent agenda is contingent upon the uh, following of the agreement with the planning department regarding their proposed conditions for the case. Uh, the case number 299 had been previously removed from the consent agenda and a late add to the proposed consent agenda is 2017-281 involving the property at 1818 Morena Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 281? 
Seeing none, the cases recommended for today's consent agenda are as follows. Case 241, 260, 275, 277, 291, 294, 296 with the agreed conditions, 297 with the agreed conditions, and the late addition, case 281. At this point, Mr. Chairman, we would solicit a vote from the board on the consent agenda. Okay, those cases have been properly moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously, five to zero. Mr. Chairman, we'll prepare to present the first case to the board. For the members of the public, if your case was on the consent agenda, you've been approved, you're free to stay, you're free to leave if you wish. In just a couple of minutes, we'll start all the other cases that will be heard by the board today. John Michael, did you say 294 when you were reading the list of? 294 is not on the consent agenda. If I did, that was misspeaking on my part. 294 was removed from the consent agenda based upon opposition present and will be heard in its regular order. Apologies. We'll amend the record accordingly. Our court reporter caught it for us. Yes. <laughs> we love our court reporter. <laughs> they listen more than we do. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the first case that will be presented to the board for its consideration today is case number 2017-265. You've already heard from Council Member uh, Withers with regard to the matter, and the case involves Jason P. Wiley, the appellant and co-owner of the property located at 96 North 8th Street, shown here on the zoning map, and from the aerial photo. It's an item A appeal challenging the Codes Department's determination that the action in question constituted one strike against the short-term rental permit as contemplated under the regulatory ordinance. Mr. Wiley is represented by Mr. Holland. Mr. Holland will have, uh, because there is opposition present, will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Of course, you'll want to save any portion of that time you might want for a rebuttal here out of this originally allocated 15 minutes. Before we get started on this case, um, I want a show of hands of who is in support of this. Raise your hand. And you all can raise your hand, of course. <laughs> and who is in opposition to this case? Raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. As reflected in the citation that was issued, my clients were cited under 1116040A1. And that code section is entitled Lewd Conduct in Commercial Establishments and states as follows. It is unlawful for any person in any commercial establishment to knowingly commit the following acts. To expose to public view that portion of the breast, which is defined by the areola, the pubic hair, the cleft of the buttocks, or the genitals. When such exposure is patently offensive within the contemporary community standards, has no specific or no serious scientific, literary, political, or artistic merit, and such appeals to the purient interests of the average person. 1704060 defines commercial establishment as an establishment used for the conduct of a business. My clients own and reside at 96 North 8th Street. Is it, a, it, is a, it is a residence, multifamily, located on property that is zoned MUGA, situated on a major corridor, but fronting on North 8th Street. The owner has a type three multifamily operating permit. The property owners reside at this address, except when they're traveling for their job. The lewd conduct in question is an inflatable novelty doll. While perhaps juvenile or in poor taste, 
It doesn't rise to the level of meeting the conditions of the code, which clearly contemplate humans, not inflatable plastic. No areola, no pubic hair, no genitals, just an inflatable no novelty doll. As such, no violation of 1116040A1. And Mr. Chairman, that's where I intended to conclude my comments, but I heard from the council member some other section of the code. Uh, I can't remember the number, I'm sure it's in the record. Uh, but I think it's 1112040. 060. 060. One, what I hear on that citation for that violation or alleged violation, we're here on what was stated in the citation, 1116040A1. So recently, some other examples of this type of activity have been tried in Nashville, March 2017. This stick figure was cited under a state statute that mirrors exactly 1112 040. And it talks about what is obscene. And it says the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the purient interest. Or B, the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work depicts or describes in a potentially offensive way sexual conduct, and the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Now, those terms that I just read you in that state statute come from the three-part test of Miller v. California, which is a 1973 case of the United States Supreme Court. Basically, that statute recites exactly what Miller v. California holds. And so what happened in that case, this recent case, was the police department pulled this person over for having that sticker on their car, citing the same type of ordinance statute language. The defendant filed a motion for an injunction requesting Metro, or that Metro be enjoined from enforcing that. Metro agreed to it. Not only that, they agreed to cease the prosecution, they also entered into a declaratory judgment order finding that it was a violation of the First Amendment. Metro Legal did that. And so the big picture, we're talking about Title 11. And to, to the people that are here watching on TV, the problem with this case is that the complainant should have reported it to the police department, if anybody, not to the codes department, because this involves alleged criminal activity. And to address this point, there's a 1984 case, Father Ryan High School versus Oak Hill, because I'm sure you may hear from the zoning administrator or whomever, well, the council gave this board this power to, hear, to look at these other sections of the code as it relates to short-term rentals. Father Ryan versus Oak Hill Academy holds, a municipality may not confer powers upon a board not granted by the enabling statute, and such grant is ultra virus and void. Not or void, and void. So tell the non-lawyers what that statement means. It means it didn't happen. They can't do it. The Metro Council cannot give you power to regulate 
beyond the enabling statute, which is 13, TCA 137207. If you heard John Michael at the outset of this, he said he's going to put Title 17 into the record. Says that every meeting. It's because Title 17 is within your jurisdiction. Can, may I ask for a quick clarification? So, are, I could be wrong here. Are you saying that this is a, uh, the matter at hand is actually a, uh, a criminal case and we are not empowered to hear criminal cases? I mean, I, I think that's, that's a clear fallback position, yes. I, I think 137207, Subsection 1 says the Board of Zoning Appeals has the power to hear and decide appeals where it is alleged by the appellant that there is an error in any order, requirement, permit, decision, or refusal made by the Municipal Building Commissioner or any other official in the carrying out or enforcement of any provision of any ordinance enacted pursuant to Part 2 and Part 3 of Chapter of Title 13 chapter seven and so what but it the it seems like it's here because it was a short-term rental um, situation and the statute for short-term rentals does address or as the council member has uh, presented to us uh, that statute does address you know um, situations where this might be a violation of the short-term rental um, code and and why is that not applicable here well because I, th I think it's from a logistical point a council member drives by sees the doll takes a picture sends it to the zoning administrator and the zoning administrator you know, looks at it property standards looks at it and he is cited under what his citation is, which is limited to commercial establishments, which, you know, it's abundantly clear that has no application. To so the my. council member presented it as, as a, hey, this is a short-term rental misbehavior. I mean, that's how it was presented. So, I mean, was it just on the citation? Was it, you know, is that is that what was, I guess the question is, was is this the rule that was solely relied on to deny it? Or was, there, was it the short-term rental or what? Why, why are we, yeah, I mean, So the question is, so under the short-term rental ordinance, it says if the zoning administrator determines based upon reasonably reliable information that the zoning administrator has obtained, including without limitation, public records or reports, records of regularly conducted activity, or a direct online statement against a person's interest, that three violations of this section or other code sections referenced in this section have occurred within 12 within a 12 month period the permit to operate a short term rental property may be revoked so um, there's really a two part process here the the first part was a complaint was received by the property standards division and the abate uh, notice or notice of violation was sent out by property standards that reference references that one section in the, making the determination of whether a strike should be held against this property, that lands upon me and the zoning staff. Um, I looked at a different section in making that determination. I was aware of the section that was cited under property standards, and that was fine. But I also relied upon the, another section. The section that I relied upon was 11.12.060, of the Metropolitan Code. It's disorderly house slash prostitution, gambling, and rowdiness prohibited. Um, I can read the entire section. Well, let me just read it. It says, no person who manages or controls any building, room, or enclosure, either as its owner, lessee, agent, or employee, shall allow or permit prostitution, drunkenness, unlawful sale of alcoholic beverages, gambling, the sale, exhibition or possession of any obscene material or any obscene conduct or entertainment, quarreling, fighting, rowdiness, or loud noise sufficient to constitute a breach of the peace. So as part of this section, what I relied upon was 
that we had somebody who is the owner or the at least the person under control of that particular building that allowed an exhibition of obscene material. So that's what I relied upon. When I saw the photograph of the inflatable doll that was put in the, the window, I relied upon this section in making my determination to um, implement a one strike against this property. So it, uh, so the council is arguing that if I think I'm hearing he's saying that if if it's obscenity is the issue that at some point someone would have to find uh, as fact that there was something that was obscene, correct? And are you saying that based on your reading that you you can determine if something is obscene? Or you have the authority to do that? I'm saying that it's my responsibility as a zoning administrator. Um, under the short-term rental ordinance, it, it tells me that I must make a determination. Uh, when I saw the blow-up doll, um, I made a determination that, in my opinion, that that was um, obscene material that was being displayed in that window. And now the appeal from my decision is before you. Mr. Holland, you had some other things to show us on this presentation. Yeah. And excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and d just a reminder, since the zoning administrator hit on uh, the powers under the Short-Term Rental Act for him to look at other provisions of the code, you know, Father Ryan High School versus Oak Hill Municipality may not confer powers upon the BZA not granted by the enabling statute. And, you know, talking about, you know, whether or not that's obscene or not, you know, stick figure case, Metro Legal says, yeah, we agree, it's, it's not obscene. Okay, so let's talk about the Supreme Court case. What is the scientific, literary, political, or artistic merit to this doll? Well, it has to be, it has to hit all three, Mr. Chairman, not just on a one-by-one one basis. And uh, Miller v. California is the same thing as 558-187, or excuse me, thir Title 39, Chapter 17, 901 of Tennessee Code, which we know is a criminal code. And it says the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the pure interest. And that's kind of, that's step one. Well, this inflatable novelty doll that you know doesn't even meet the definition of the ordinance that my client was cited under because it's contemplating a human, doesn't have all these qualities that you know, despite you know what others would think, it's not a sex doll. It, you know, it's it's got air in it. That's it. No, no orifices, holes, or anything like that. So it has to. The first step in this, it has to appeal to someone's sexual interest. You know, perverted, and it. So it doesn't meet, doesn't meet step one. You know, it ran that picture. The councilman posted it on a Facebook group that had forty-one thousand people on. It. So he didn't think it was too offensive. And I guess that, well, that, that's an interesting point. The, but the, um, well, that, 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 that's an interesting point. The question I was going to ask before you made the interesting point was, uh, sorry. Okay, there's a lot to think about. And, and, and this is, you know, this is a, 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 an interesting, tough case, but um, that, that seems very simple. It seems like the, the sides have very, uh, firm things to say and, and believe, but yet they're complicated when you get beneath the surface of it. But the, I guess the question, you, you had just said it wasn't um, a, a sex doll, it was a novelty doll, and the, the question you know, I asked was how, how would uh, a neighbor or someone driving down the street be expected to know the difference from that distance? And then you yeah. made the comment that it was widely distributed <laughs> and so but uh, the question still holds I mean is that difference important um, in the way that this thing was displayed yeah what are you telling your neighbors Ethel don't look 
Well, I think the courts have struggled with this issue mightily, you know, because it's kind of like opinion. You know, what's offensive to one, or what's obscene to one, maybe not to someone else. And when you get down to the basics in contemplation of our ordinance, then it, it doesn't fit the category. Just because it, the, it's located on a property that happens to be a short-term rental doesn't turn it into, you know, some super status. You know, same, same as like a long-term rental. 46% yeah. of the housing stock in this county is long-term rental. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So if this happened in a long-term rental or just someone's house, is this a violation of the code? I don't think so. But I also think, you know, this board and zoning administrator shouldn't be making those determinations. I don't know how many cases like this have come before this board before. You know, many of you here been here longer, coming down here on a frequent basis more than me, but I would suspect the answer that's none. <laughs> right. the, the first that I know of, and, and hopefully the last, but the, um, just in my personal opinion, I don't want to hear these, this thing, this kind of case again. Um, but I, I guess, it, I mean, it really does, you know, it, if, if, it, if it's not a violation for long-term rental, but it is a violation for uh, a short-term rental, that seems to give weight to the basis that it is, that we should hear it, right? I mean, that's, I mean, I think that part of your argument was that we shouldn't hear it, but, but it sounds like if it has potential to violate the short-term rental code, then that would make it under our purview. I don't think you should hear it at all. I think if I drove by a house and saw this and, you know, it ended my sensibilities, then I would contact the police department because this is a Title 11 section of the code. It's not a short-term, you know, it's not a zoning matter. It's a criminal matter because in the similar set of facts, it was a police officer involved in that case. And to, you know, keep this from ever happening, the, the complaint should have went to the, the police. Much like a noise complaint, you know, you don't call a zoning administrator, you report that to the police department. So Mr. Holland, I noticed you had something related to bachelorettes. Can we talk about bachelorettes? And, and you know, just talking about, you know, so that image that is part of the presentation showed up on Channel 4, it's on Channel 5, it's been on the scene, you know, two or three times. And that answers the question of whether or not it's obscene. If it was obscene, we'd have never saw it. Just us. John Michael, if you could go to the last slide. So this is the actual, on the left-hand corner, that's what was on the news channels. When you're looking at the screen on the left, uh, and I've hopefully, you know, that's it. And the image on the right is the cover of the national scene. So to your knowledge, is there any, when, when this did appear on any of the news stations, were, were, was, was any aspect of, of the, um, the I'll, you know, some no. are going to say novelty doll, some are going to say whatever, but was it, were any aspects uh, blurred or no. concealed? It was, no. It was presented in all those publications That's right. as this photo. That's right. Were there any FCC fines or? Not, not that I've heard, and I've, I've contacted those stations, you know, to find out. If it was obscene, you would have blurred it, correct? And they all said yes. Okay. Uh, and the, the, what I would point your attention to in, in the cover of the scene there is the necklaces on the women. And, you know, so if we're going to talk, get into this, you know, what I call the rabbit hole of obscenity, which is, which one? You know, my answer would be neither. And absent your, or pending your questions, I'd hold the remainder of that time for rebuttal. Any other questions for Mr. Holland? Um, can we get a short summary? What I think I heard you say is you don't believe that Title 11 applies or we're allowed to judge on Title 11? Is that correct? That is one of the arguments, correct. Another argument is that this is not a commercial establishment? That is correct. And was there something else? 
Were those, were those your two main arguments? And, and three, it's not a big. Okay. I have but, questions oh. for our, our attorney, if that's okay. Is this, okay. Um, Title 11, I mean, it's it's in the Metro Court a Code of Ordinances. Um, I want to ask you about that a second, but we used to rule on Title 6 of short-term rental properties before it moved into Title 17. So I don't know if that's a good argument that Title 11 doesn't apply here or that we can't rule on it because we used to rule on another title. So. I, I, if I recall, the short-term rental ordinance used to be in Title 6, part of it was in Title 6 and part of it was in Title 17. Um, with respect to Title 11, um, I think the distinguish, distinguishing factor here that has been brought up is that this is a short-term rental. Um, if, if this ha were a long-term rental, Title 11, a Title 11 violation would not come before y'all because long-term rental issues don't come before y'all, typically. A short-term rental, part of the regulations of the short-term rental ordinance says that you have to abide by um, uh, re regulations regarding the public peace and welfare contained in the Metropolitan Code. Title 11 is the public peace and welfare section of the code. So because that is in Title 17 under the short-term rental regulations, I do think it is properly before you. And I have a, a zoning question now. Um, M-U-G-A, that's mixed use, what's the G? General. And that, I don't have the zoning code in front of me, but I wouldn't think of that designation as residential. Mixed use generally allows office, residential, and a variety of retail establishments. Um, it is truly mixed use. Residential being um, something that is allowed. It's allowed, but it's not an R zoning. It's not R6 or RS6 or RM20. Correct. Okay. And Ms. Carpenter, on behalf of staff, to further what the zoning administrator said, in single family, two family, and multifamily residential uses are all three permitted by right under all of our mixed use zoning districts, including MUG and MUGA. I understand that. It's just, um, I don't think about that being purely residential because it, you're allowed mixed use, you're allowed other um, functions. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Herbert. Um, so, obviously, since you you obviously have a, a position on this because you, uh, you you did what you did, and that's why we're here. <laughs> how how do you determine if uh, if it is appropriate for you to take this action, if this case had come up, I mean, it, are, are there situations where you go, well, this, this doesn't rise to the standard for me to do anything? How do you decide not to do something uh, in a case like this? Or is that, is, that a, is that a fair question? I think it's the, the authority that's given under the short-term rental ordinance, and it says if the zoning administrator determines and so it, it puts me in the position to make a determination. And admittedly, I looked through the entire Metropolitan Code, the, the public welfare sections of the code and Title 17, and there's nothing that addresses this dead on. Um, but the, the one section under the, the public peace and welfare under 11.12.060 did address the exhibition of obscene material. That's the closest thing that I could find in the entire Metropolitan Code. Um, I just, I felt like displaying a, a blow up doll um, rose to the level of requiring a one strike against the property. It's not a revocation of the permit, it's one strike, and that one strike evaporates after the one year of the permit elapses, and when they renew, they start all over again. Um, 
I just, I felt like it rose to that level and that was the, in all frankness, that was the, the closest um, ordinance that I could find in the public peace and welfare section that had um, any applicability and so I relied upon it. And the, is there, can you tell, the, you had read something about the obscenity uh, piece, but there was also something about rowdiness or general behavior is, I mean, is that, because I think that there's, there's some question about, you know, is this obscene or not obscene, and is, was there other aspects of it that, and yet at the same time you think, well, you know, yeah, anyway, what, what are, were there any other aspects of that ordinance that, that would apply besides determining whether or not it was obscene? Well, I mean, the, the ordinance talks about prostitution, drunkenness, unlawful sale of alcoholic beverages, gambling, um, and then it talks about the sale, exhibition, or possession of any obscene material or any obscene conduct or entertainment, and then it talks about quarreling, fighting, rowdiness, or loud noise sufficient to constitute a breach of the peace. I didn't have any information regarding rowdiness or, or fighting or quarreling or breach of the peace. The only information that I had was the blow up doll in the window. A little bit about a disorderly house. Um, I have a set of laws from the city of Nashville from 1828 and that word pops up there, which was mainly related to gambling, prostitution, other things. And so this code has evolved. Uh, it used to say even Wheel of Fortune. But today, is this the closest that you can kind of put this in, the, the code that was meant for those types of acts, that there's nothing close to a violation besides talking about gambling houses and prostitution houses? Unfortunately, I could find nothing else in the code anywhere, and I gave it a good hard look. Um, and, you know, I'm also, I, I'm also relying upon what, um, what property standards did um, and the way that they sent their notice. I'm relying upon that as well. But I, I conducted my own research into it, and um, I landed more appropriately on um, 11.12.060. Um, I, I researched everything else I could find in the Metropolitan Code, whether it was with respect to public peace and welfare or otherwise and this is the closest that I could come. Admittedly, it's not on all, four, on all fours, but it's the best that I had and I made the determination. Any other questions for the zoning administrator or legal counsel? Let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward. Those who wish to speak will have 15 minutes cumulatively to speak in opposition on this case. Please state your name and address for the record and why you were in opposition. My name is Pat Williams. I live at 4301 Elkins Avenue in Southern Park. Thank you all for your service as well as all the council people who so generously have given of their time. My grandson graduated from Hume Fogg High School just last spring. He was fortunate before Hume Fogg to have three years at Meg's Academic Magnet Middle School. This property in question is less than one block from Meg's. I was fortunate enough to pick my grandson up after school for his entire school life, and I, I was very much involved with his schools. It has been stated at some point that, oh, this activity was outside of school hours. I'm sorry, that does not fly. There are, I can vouch for the fact that there are many after school activities at, that happen at Meg's as, as most schools, I'm sure. This property, as I said, is less than a block from the school. It is on the route that everybody takes. I'm sure there are a few exceptions that everybody takes to get to Meg's. You turn off Main Street onto North 8th, where this property is located. You turn left on Howarden, which runs behind the school, between the school and Frederick Davis Park. It is one way. Then you go to North 7th and back to Main Street. 
the, the carpool, which is very long, there are no school buses because it's a magnet school. So kids come from all over the county. We, some of our best and brightest attend Megs. And so the school line forms down Howerton, down North 8th for a long ways. As I said, there are many after school activities and on weekends, I'm sure there are kids that, say, that have family from out of town or friends that come from out of town and want to show them their school. They should not have to observe something as disgusting as this. I wish that you had the power not only to make this a strike one against this property, but to call it a, a pop fly, one swing and you're out. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jason Garrett, 1508 Severe Court. I also live in District 6 in uh, Mr. Withers' uh, district, and we pass by this location quite a bit. I think um, what I find interesting about this is just would this be permissible by the legislators that have written these short-term ordinances? Is it, something that's accept is it something that's acceptable? And I don't think that it is. I don't think we have to get into technicalities of which code this falls under. Is this a criminal activity or a codes enforcement activity? I think it's just something that isn't consistent with what we're doing when we let short-term operators run without any type of supervision for their, for their guests. I think it's, if this barely can rise to the level of counting as a strike, what else could? And I think that's very, sends a very strong message that issues like parking or noise, things that almost can't be recorded or testified against in real time, then this shows that none of those issues can be enforced. Um, I'm sorry to hear that uh, Mrs. Uh, Council Lady Allen wasn't able to attend today to uh, speak to this because I know she spent a long time at the last meeting where this was deferred. Um, but I'm very concerned that this isn't, uh, that, that we're not holding these to a different standard because this, uh, in comparison with the long-term argument that's often given with short-term rentals is that the long-term resident, I think, would have an opportunity. They do this once or twice or maybe once, then you can kind of correct that type of behavior if the behavior is deemed unacceptable. But for the short-term rental, I uh, guess this could be happening over and over, over and over and over. And the net effect of this is just that the, the long-term residents that are nearby uh, will leave. And were this to happen in a hotel that was properly staffed, uh, I think a quick call to the front desk would have this removed immediately. I don't, I don't think any hotel would want their name to be on this, but in this case, there's no way for something like this to be happening because there are technicalities of how quickly does a person respond, how are you measuring how quickly that the property owner can respond to this. So I think it's, this is just a good example, I think a test case that shows that uh, if this isn't a strike, um, and I definitely respect Mr. Holland's uh, um, ability to see all of the difficulties uh, that are in enforcement, but if this isn't a strike, what, what possibly could be a strike for, for running these? And are we opening the floodgates to having operations that work this way all across the county? Um, because this, if you think about this and the type of epidemic where this is infiltrated neighborhoods, um, and these might be covered by 608, they might not if they're owner-occupied uh, rentals, which won't be touched by new legislation under consideration, that this is really setting, I think, a strong standard for what um, owners may understand that they never, ever have to get that involved with uh, the running of their operations. And I think that's a clear contrast and was never um, in the, uh, in, in never what the legislators had anticipated for, for the, how this to be used inside of the city. I, I think it's, it, it's just a very interesting case to see. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Logan Key, and I live at 1411 Fatherland Street in District 6. I'm also vice chair of the Coalition for Nashville Neighborhoods, and we advocate for the interests, uh, the collective interests of Nashville's residential neighborhoods. Uh, I do support the testimony from Councilman Withers uh, earlier today. Uh, I think he is uh, particularly uh, versant on this issue because there are over 600 permitted short-term rentals in District 6 where uh, Mr. Garrett and I live. And so I think uh, Councilman Withers has a very uh, thorough understanding of the, the acuity of this issue. Also, uh, very strongly support the zoning administrator's interpretation of the code in this 
in this case. I understand that the notion of um, what is or isn't inappropriate is a subjective determination. Somebody has to make that determination, and I think the zoning administrator is perfectly qualified to do that, and I think he made a reasonable judgment, uh, notwithstanding the fact that that determination was subjective. Uh, also, want to make it clear that, that the short-term rental Right. I'm not an attorney, as far as I know, neither are the people uh, to my right, but the, the short-term rental uh, clauses in the code give the, the zoning administrator and the codes department and ultimately this board uh, broad discretion for interpreting uh, the code and for executing the code. And so I think you need not uh, be fearful of whether or not you're encroaching into, uh, into uh, the territory of the police department or whoever. I also think the code is, uh, defines strikes very broadly, giving the zoning administrator the discretion uh, over those within a reasonable uh, framework, which I think he's, uh, which I think he's done in this case. So, when, how, how, help me understand your concept of the broad discretion to define a strike and, and how this would be part of it. Well, uh, if, if, in, in, in other words, if, if if you feel like we're getting caught up too much in the specificity of the rule, um, you know, and, and your, your point on it's, it's what is, I totally understand from a citizen's perspective, you know, at me as a neighbor, or what, you know, uh, would understand, but, and that's the frustration of this, of me uh, as a member of this board, is that I don't get the luxury of saying, is this right, is this fair, is this common sense, is it not? It's like, no, what, what specifically did they violate? <laughs> you know, because it's not about, we're not a legislative body, that's what the council's supposed to do, is say what's, what's good and what's fair and how should everybody behave. And we're supposed to look at it totally differently when somebody doesn't. Just do, so you'll know, the and, time clock doesn't count against yeah, you. Yeah, that, well, yeah, so oh, it didn't stop. Oh, yeah, I thought it stopped when the uh, Yeah, I was asking is, a question. So, I'm sorry. So, I, so it is really important for us to know if we, and you know, and it's a little bit tough to hear, you know, folks saying, well, we're the last hope of this and we have to do whatever and put some kind of burden on us when it might be a legislative uh, failure or hole, so to speak, that is the reason that we're here. So one of the good things that might come out of it, however it falls either way, is the, the, the council has an opportunity to, uh, to correct whatever, uh, they may wish to based on what we decide. But you're, you're the specifically to you, sir, is, is uh, speak to the broadness rather, because we have questioned a lot about the specific, you know what I'm saying, the specifics. Tell me about what broad authority you think we need to have. Sure, I'll, I'll address that. And if I, could make a, if I could make a point of where I've seen the clock start and stop yeah, you a few times. You'll be given ample time. Just go yeah, ahead and you. Okay. About seven minutes or so. Okay. I think it started, at, it was at seven when something when I started so, asking. Uh, so I'll, I'll address that. First of all, uh, here again, I'm not an attorney, and I would, I would certainly defer any uh, questions uh, of a legal matter to the board's counsel in this case. Uh, but the, the section of the code that Mr. Herbert read earlier uh, basically says if the zoning administrator uh, determines uh, based on looking at public, it's very broad, public records, reports, records of regularly conducted activity, or direct or online statement against a person's own interest, that three violations of the section have occurred. I think that's fairly broad. I think it could be uh, anything from, from a personal observation shared with the codes department uh, to a formal police report. I think if you look uh, higher up in the code, where uh, it where it discusses complaints, uh, and presumably that section of the code that Mr. Herbert read would, would be referring to the entire section, the whole code. If you look back up uh, the code a little bit, it talks about uh, documented complaints as as being the type of complaints that go to the Metro Coast Department, Police Department, or Public Works. So uh, even even police. Uh, the opposition mentioned uh, we should call the police. Uh, even a formal police report based on what I'm reading in the code would presumably be applicable uh, as a strike you know, if that was made in the zoning administrator's determination. So, you know, I mean, but there's been a lot of talk about obscenity and yet um, it's been testified to. It hasn't, we haven't seen it, but I, I have no reason to doubt it that it was on the television stations and uh, the exact picture and certainly the, it was put out for wide distribution uh, you know uh, by the council member and 
to say, hey, yeah, this is what this is the kind of activity that's going on, and I don't like it, and I'm sure a lot of other neighbors don't, and I, I don't know a lot of folks that would want that next door necessarily. Um, so you're saying that if, if you know, folks complained and they felt like it was obscene, either even if it didn't meet the technical definition, that that's within the realm of the zoning administrator to say, hey, I'm getting a lot of complaints, there's general bad behavior, I think you deserve a strike. Is that, that's uh, what you're yes, saying? I, I would argue that yes, that that is the case, and, and I, I do think it, it has to be consistently applied. So if the zoning administrator was making arbitrary determinations, I think that would be out of bounds. But as long as it's consistently applied, yes, I think so. And I don't know if others agree. I assume they would. Uh, but, and here, but let me go one step beyond that, uh, and and point out that you're going to continue to hear cases like this. So. Uh, if, if you allow this to go uh, as a non-strike, uh, I think it's going to put you in a difficult spot the next time one of these come along. Because here again, we've got over 600 of these permitted just in District 6, where I live. And so you're going to, over the course of the next several years, short-term rentals are new, they're innovative, they're edgy, and you're going to continue to receive these type uh, uh, appeals uh, if the zoning administrator makes a determination that is, is not the perceived interest of the permit holder. The only other thing I want to say, and, and I'll uh, certainly defer to others uh, that wish to speak, uh, all, of, all of our position goes back to a desire to protect the integrity of neighborhoods, uh, to protect the quality of life in neighborhoods, uh, and to protect the quality of life of, of, residential, um, uh, of residential settings. Uh, granted, you've got a mixed use zoning here, uh, but you've got a residential, uh, you've got a community that, that includes residential use, and I would uh, argue that uh, those interests ought to be protected, and I think the zoning administrator's decision was wise and sound in that regard. So, to, to be clear, uh, Ms. Williams, uh, do, you, do you find this to be obscene? Beg your pardon? Do you, do you find the blow-up doll to be obscene? Do I find it to be obscene? Yes, yes, I do. And Mr. Garrett? Personally, it's not something I'd like to see repeated on a massive scale or to have uh, for, for this just to be normal behavior on this type of residence, just because making comparison to other types of uh, operations where people are spending the night, it's not something that's normal. It's out of the ordinary. It's not something you'd see on a hood window or an, another normal residence, I think, without drawing some type of attention. I don't think that these types of operations have been permitted to draw attention. That's Mr. Key, do you find it obscene? I do think it was obscene in the manner in which it was displayed publicly, and I think the zoning administrator made a valid determination in that regard. Thank you. Can I ask you, um, I think you read something um, that uh, constitutes a strike. Um, where did you read that from? So the, the section of the code that uh, Mr. Herbert read earlier uh, would be from uh, the short-term rental uh, Regulations around short-term rental, uh, that's Title 17.16.250 uh, under residential accessory use, and that uh, excerpt I read would be from, uh, bear with me, let's see, there's A, B, C, D, E, uh, so this would appear to be E4, no. I beg your pardon. Seems to be E2. L, Roman numeral 2. And I would uh, hope the uh, legal counsel would correct me if I'm stating a it, factual inaccuracy um, there. It's 17 dot 16 dot 250 subsection 4 dot L dot Roman numeral 2, lowercase Roman numeral 2. I'm trying to find it. Is it in our board packet? I just wanted to read it myself. It's in Title 17. I don't know if it's in the board packet. Um, I'd be glad to submit this for them. Uh, I would submit this for the record. I'm also here uh, with interest in another case, and I was planning to, to use this as well. So, Can I just look at it for a second? 
I can pass you mine. It's circled right there. May I add one other quick thing? Uh, it's not only kids and families coming to Meg's that, that would be uh, exposed to this, this property with this kind of behavior and visual things going on. Doug Frederick Douglas Park, as I mentioned, is right across Howerton, right behind the school. So it's all age kids coming with their families to play at that park that would, that would come down North 8th right by this property. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? Uh, if I could just close uh, by reiterating the fact that, that we feel very strongly that the zoning administrator made uh, a very reasonable, uh, thoughtful decision here. Uh, while it is subjective, it was uh, a reasonable interpretation of the code and a reasonable application of the code. And so we would uh, urge you to uh, reject the application that this not be considered a strike against the permit. I'd just like to thank whomever responsible for fixing the microphone at the podium. We can actually hear everybody speaking over there now. Thank you. Okay, anyone else to speak in opposition for this? Can, can we hear from our enforcer on this case? Let's hear after we hear from Mr. Okay. Holland. Mr. Holland, rebuttal. Mr. Chairman, I don't know the lady that lives in 4301 Elkins Avenue, but I do know that address is in Sylvan Park, and the subject property is at 96 North 8th Street in East Nashville. I do know Mr. Garrett, and I do know Mr. Key. consider them friends of mine, but they don't live even two miles from this property. So I hear their general grievance against short-term rentals, and I get it, but it, you know, it's nothing specific to this property. You know, they certainly weren't on the notice. Well, the, the lady did say that her, her yeah, grandson she had a family goes to Meg's and she picked her grandchild up every day. Well, it, it happened at 8 o'clock on a Friday night, and it was removed not later than 8.30 p.m. on the same Friday night. So I, my ch I have children, and they go to school in East Nashville, and I go down that street every day. You know, so, so I don't think that would render her super citizen status, particularly concerning the timeline with when it happened. And also, it leads to the next point, it was a very temporary situation. Uh, the, once the council member posted it on Facebook in this East Nashville group, okay, the, so the property owners had it removed. So Mr. Holland, why did it get put up and why did it get taken down? It got, I don't know, I can't speak to why it was put up, but you know. Aren't you representing the people? The, the, property, the property owners property? right here. Okay. I'll ask you the same thing. Why did this get put up in your property by? Yeah, and Jeffrey Stoner, 96 North 8th Street. Um, I rent it out on occasion, but it's my permanent residence, and I have a permit because it's required, and it was rented that weekend, so I'm assuming possibly just like the picture next to it, the bachelorette or bachelor party um, was there renting my location. Did you contact them to take it down? Immediately. Or? You did? Yes. And what did you tell them? I just said, we need that taken out of the window. He goes, it was just a harmless joke. And they took it down immediately. He said, I meant no harm from it, and I'm so sorry. And it was removed immediately. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, and, and Mr. Miller's comments at the outset of the meeting, he said that this inflatable novelty doll was, quote, not all that uncommon in East Nashville. And the reason why that's important. Wait a minute. You're saying that if I drive around East Nashville, I'm going to see inflatable dolls in people's windows like this one? That's what, that's Council Member Withers' opinion. That's what he expressed at the outset of this meeting. I didn't say that. He said that. But I would like to get to the point of why that is important, because we're digging down, I feel like, in what is obscene or not. And in the statute and in Miller v. California, the first sentence of that 
is the average person applying contemporary community standards. And so if it's not all that uncommon, and in a community in which we live in, we have down on Church Street, we have strip clubs. We have a Hustler Hollywood store. We have the cover of the Nashville scene with a certain necklace on women. We have Musica and the Roundabout. So well, while these are all different. Mr. Holland, Musica was put up by this metro government and it is considered art. I understand. So why are you lumping music in? Well, because I think they're all different. Because we're talking about the community standards. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. I get more questions of going around the roundabout than I would going down North 8th Street on a Friday night at 8.30 when school is not in session. Regarding Church Street, I happen to have a project in that area. So I know it's zoned. Um, for an adult entertainment district overlay. Um, I don't think this property is zoned that way. No, th that's correct, but when we, we get into the definition of obscenity and the case law, then we're, we're talking about the community standards. We're not talking about a standard based on a certain piece of property yeah, zone. You just used Church Street as an example, so I was pointing that out. Right, I was just pointing where the where it's located, not the street. Well, the street wasn't important, the activity was. So what do you have to say to the opposition? They say they're offended by it, they drop their school kids out, they don't want to see stuff like that, they think that East Nashville shouldn't have things like this. What do you say to them? Well, I, I, I appreciate that concern. I've, I will also have another client that is, you know, pro short-term rental community. I, I see those three individuals on a routine basis. And th this was a great media story. And, but my client is still entitled to due process. And, and in his bundle of sticks that he has is a short-term rental permit. And taking a strike away that he holds in his bundle of sticks is it, called due process. And I understand how you, some people would like to write the law, enforce the law, and do away with due process, but I would submit to you that due process is a stubborn cuss. And I'm thankful for it. I think we all should be. But I don't think we should do away with my client's due process because it scores a political point, particularly when, if the members of the Metro Council would like to change it, the, the short-term rental ordinance, and you know, I've been going to meetings for over three months now on that score, and they want to put in certain language in the code that would contemplate this situation, no problem. We, we wouldn't be here. Um, noise is typically considered a, a strike, correct? You know, no matter what, I guess here's kind of the rub. Just because you filed a complaint or a complaint gets filed doesn't mean it doesn't get contested some way. You know, so if somebody filed a noise complaint and you know they were and they wanted to challenge it, I think they could have a mechanism for challenging it. But I just don't think the courts would look at a temporary situation, as was this case and would be other cases, of saying, you know, you shouldn't lose your rights due to a temporary inconvenience. Yeah. Um, just staying on the noise a second, where, is there somewhere in an ordinance outside of Title 17 or inside, or in the STRP ordinance, where noise is listed as a complaint, because I think that's a common strike. Well, I know that noise, uh, the noise ordinance is, um, I know there is a noise ordinance found in Title 11, which, as I said earlier, is referenced in 
Title 17 when it says that STRP occupants must abide by the regulations regarding the public peace and welfare, which is Title 11. So both those types of complaints, this obscene yeah. complaint and this noise complaint, are all in Title 11? Correct, which is, as I, like I just said, it's, it's referenced um, the public peace and welfare, saying that they have to abide by that. Any other questions? Do you all have anything else to add? Okay. No, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. We are going to hear from Mr. Osborne of the Codes Department. Next. So we'll start by asking the typical questions um, that I think we already know how you've heard about it, but you know, kind of how did you investigate this and how does this fall into other things that you've done? All right, do you all have a copy of this picture? We've seen it enough, okay. I think, today. <laughs> all right, well, on August 4th, I received the complaint at 6.54 p.m. Um, so I got to investigate it on Monday morning. Um, immediately met with my supervisors because this isn't something that we routinely deal with uh, to find out what we needed to do with it. Um, we browsed it's, through. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did you say something you do not routinely deal with? No, uh, I think we've only dealt with this maybe a handful of times. And usually there isn't a uh, person to testify. So by the time I get there, it is indeed gone. So I can't do anything with it. Did you drive out there anyway? With uh, Mr. Withers' testimony, I didn't see the need to at that time. Okay. Um, I did go by there uh, by the compliance state. I did send on the abate letter. Um, I met with my supervisors. We briefly looked through uh, Chapter 11 to see where this should fall. Um, we glanced at Disorderly House, but seeing as how the first two lines after that were prostitution and gambling, we went to something that was uh, more affili affiliated with the blow up doll. Um, we couldn't find anything that matched it exactly, but we did the best we could at the time. Um, so I did send them the notice for uh, lewd behavior. A and notice of good what? The notice for lewd behavior. Okay, and that's a strike. Um, anytime they receive one of these notices, it could be considered a strike. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So some of us, it's go too fast in our cars, get pulled over by our fine Metro Police Department, totally doing their job, and their job sometimes is to write you a ticket, and sometimes, depending on the situation, they will let you off with a warning. Is there a situation where you let people off with a warning, and if so, when do you, would you use that? I don't really get to make that decision. If I see a violation of the law, I must write uh, a letter for it, and that determination for the strike or not is left up to the zoning administrator. So the other, you said that maybe three or four times it's happened. Is there a similar case where, you know, you said, or I guess the three or four times it happened, those were similar cases where something was in a window or there was some kind of, or what, what were the other cases? Um, one of them was a inflatable penis that was put up outside of the, out, um, the exterior light of the house. It was brightly illuminated. By the time I got there, it was gone. But it happened at night. And, I didn't get there till the next day. And did that in, did that result in a in a strike against that? I, I can't use somebody else's pictures um, as evidence, so I wasn't able to take action at that time. They they would have to testify that that's their pictures um, for me to be able to use it to send a notice. So is this the first strike that you know of that's? occurred because of sexually oriented material being on the property? To my knowledge. Any other questions? So have there been other complaints about the property, noise, nothing else? This is the only one? Um, there was a complaint about the renewal for the permit, but I didn't find it to be valid. Um, there were no other short-term rental complaints about this property. Any other questions? You mentioned that you couldn't use other people's uh, photographs, but you, you accepted Councilman Withers. Is, is it because he's a councilman? And, and it's because he was willing to testify in court if necessary. Okay, thank you. And and to be clear, just because you issue the letter does not mean they get a strike. It's just the, the first step. Correct. Uh, the zoning administrator makes that decision. Any other questions? Anything else to add? Okay. 
Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Well, it seems like we have a couple of things we have to find. Uh, and I, I think the root of what we have to find is, is the item in question obscene or not? Because I, I think once that determination is made, then all the other questions become moot. That, that's my opinion. I, I, I sort of proffer that for consideration. And I don't find that it does meet the definition of obscenity. Uh, so that's where I stand on that. Well, the, the, you know, the, there's a lot of things that are really frustrating, and I, I expressed it a minute ago, and I don't want to go too much more into it, but um, it, is, it is the case where, uh, you know, I, I totally understand uh, neighbors and others, uh, you know, not wanting uh, this next door. I get it. Um, you know, I get that it was, you know, if, if, if all the testimony was, was factual, which you have no reason to, to believe otherwise, but that it was a, you know, somebody maybe goofing off and doing something they shouldn't and, and, you know, got caught just like someone speeding did, maybe broke the law, maybe didn't. Uh, I'm troubled by the fact that uh, it's been said a couple times, well, that, you know, we couldn't, you know, couldn't find something that matches it exactly. You know that that it seems like that there are are troubles uh, with the the rules as they're written um, to address this type of thing, and part of the message that we're getting from the council, which uh, some council members sometimes, which I, I don't uh, necessarily uh, believe, is that we're we're the we have to, you know, uphold these rules and do what they, you know, the intent is. And it's like, no, you, you know, we're we're going to find the holes in the rules and uh, through through these kind of strange cases, and uh, you know, you, you guys can fix the rules. But you know, the fact that the that that there's not an exact uh, statute, and the fact that all of the news channels and newspapers uh, publish this, I, I have a tough time one finding it to be obscene, although I certainly understand why some might find it offensive. Um, there are just multiple judgments of independent organizations that have said, that are bound by obscenity rules that have said they didn't see it that way and published it. So Yeah, I agree, including Facebook. Facebook has obscenity rules, and as far as I know, it was not removed from Facebook or you know someone lost their account because they published this. Um, I agree with you, and you know this tortured. You know what rule did we put it in? Do we put it in the old 19th century disorderly house rule, or do we have these kind of more modern rules that just apply to obscenity and exposing body parts? And I remember this case when we actually approved these row houses, a very narrow lot, and there was opposition. And we spent more time today talking about this doll than building this pretty major development over there. What's the actual appeal? This is an item A appeal. Uh, the zoning administrator found that they were in violation, therefore giving them a strike. And so the people appealing this are saying, we don't feel that this violation should have a strike against us as it relates to short-term rentals. Gotcha. So I'll make a motion if, if you're ready to entertain one. I mean, the, the only, I guess the only, the only I'm, I'm almost there, but the only question I, is that the sense of a broader um, subjective judgment that the opposition had raised that I think was in that section I mean, is that is that something where, um, if kind of based on the complaints and based on the information, the zoning administrator says, you know, this is kind of doesn't really feel like it's it's right within the law. Is that is that or or does it really go down to whether or not it is by you know legal definition obscene? Well, I think the zoning administrator's authority based on 
Title 17, the short-term rental ordinance specifically, it, with respect to strikes, um, I think his authority is you know, based on reason, reasonably reliable information that he receives. Um, he has to determine if a violation of 17.16.250, which is a short-term rental, or other code sections referenced in this section. So it's broader in that it references the Title 11 Public Peace and Welfare um, and he has the authority and, in fact, the duty to interpret that and determine if it's obscene, which he did. So your role, because it's an item A appeal, is to determine if he acted in error or arbitrarily in determining that this was a strike because it was obscene and, and therefore a violation of the Title 11, which was referenced in 1716 250. My opinion, we're not, we're not here to discuss whether what we believe in obscenity or whatever. We're here to determine whether or not we believe the administrator did the job. And I support him. Well, did you want to say something first? Go ahead. I was going to say I'm with Dick on that. So you don't think the zoning administrator erred? Is that what you're saying? Well, it looks like this might be a hung vote either way. But I will make a, for the record, I will make a motion that uh, uh, I move that we find that the zoning administrator did err uh, in his determination of the obscenity in the matter, in the matter uh, without prejudice to whether he, his role is to determine such things, but solely based on the obscenity of the item, and that is the error. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I mean, the, the way, you know, I mean, it, if you say did, if it is subjective, you know, we have a, a qualified person that made a determination and we're having to decide uh, there's evidence. Ah, oh, God. I, you say who has to second it? Do I have to second it? Is that a yes or no? I don't well, know. obviously. I don't know that I want to second it because I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to come down on it. Okay, so motion fails without a second. Is there another motion? You can make the motion. Is there, is there another motion? Sure, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? Fails uh, three people against two people in favor. So John Michael. What happens now? Mr. Yeah. Chairman, as we sometimes have to note, cases like these where a, a case fails to receive four affirmative votes, um, obviously don't go through on today's agenda. The specific language reads as follows from our board rules. Um, in the event that five or more members are present and the appeal fails to receive those four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within those 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Uh, within 30 days, we are so blessed as to have no fewer than two BZA meetings. Therefore, we have two opportunities for board members who are not present today to review the file. If they confirm they have reviewed the file in its entirety and the proceedings from today's hearing, uh, they would have the opportunity to place a vote or even make a motion with regard to today's hearing at our next board meeting on November the 2nd. If at that time there are four affirmative votes in support of the motion, then that would conclude the matter. If, however, after 30 days, meaning two more meetings, there is no such uh, motion that obtains four affirmative votes, then the matter would be deemed denied by operation of law. Absent any other motions today, this would conclude our proceedings with regard to this particular case. Okay, what's next? Oh, they want a break. The board will take a brief break and reconvene with the next case.
The uh, application for a short-term rental permit was denied by the codes department because the property had already been utilized as a short-term rental operation without the legally required permit. From the staff's presentation, the zoning map here shows the property on Holly Street nearest the intersection with South 15th Street. Aerial photo shows the house from above. Street photo from the assessor's website. Uh, as we have four members, we have a quorum established and are ready to proceed. So, uh, if you would introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board regarding this case. Uh, <coughs> Montana Stewart, uh, 1504 Holly Street. Uh, it basically happened like this. Uh, I lost my job. I needed an um, immediate source of income. I had heard, um, just heard about Airbnb, used it, you know, maybe twice. I uh, had a friend that um, had participated in it um, as far as like listing his property. So I thought, okay, cool, I'll go ahead and you know list my property. Um, I'm not, um, it was on there for maybe, I'd say a week to 10 days and uh, I was talking to my, my friend, my buddy, and he asked if I had, uh, if I had applied for a permit. Well, uh, I had no idea, you know, about a permit or that you would need to, you know, need a permit to rent out a house that you own, you know, I mean, it's you, you own it. Um, so he informed me of that, uh, kind of did some research, went to the, the government website, Nashville.gov, whatever, um, saw the proper uh, steps and actually took the proper steps, uh, went to apply for the permit. I was, um, you know, there the day. Uh, and as I was applying for the permit, the gentleman said, um, you know, he was entering all the information. He was like, well, wait a minute. He was like, it looks like you have a violation. Okay, what's a violation? He said, well, you know, that, that you were operating without a permit. And he was like, did you not receive a, a notice on your door? And I was like, no, you know, no, no kind of notice or anything on my door. And he said, oh, wait a second. He said, it looks like this was posted 10 minutes ago. So I actually was, you know, in sitting at his desk applying, you know, for the permit the day that it was actually that out was violated or, you know, that it was posted. How many times did you rent the house? Twice. Uh, I mean, this was all over. I mean, this was, like I said, a period. Of, it was only uh, a period of 10 to 14 days. And maybe. after he told you, I guess, when you were in the office and he said, hey, you're in violation, you can't rent it anymore, did you take down your listings? I, I took it down. Well, first, I had followed all proper steps, you know, to apply for the permit. Then, of course, when he informed me that there was a violation, he informed me of the next uh, few proper, or that, um, Miss Debbie would be in contact with me that for, with the rest of the, you know, proper steps. Um, I, um, uh, again, I followed all proper steps and did everything that you guys, you know, had, had asked me to do and um, in full compliance. Uh, I mean, this is my primary residence um, it, with me and my, my two two-year-old daughters uh, that I have full-time. They live with me there full-time. Um, I'm just, you know, simply trying to make, uh, you know, somewhat of a living just, you know, to raise my daughters. I mean, it's my neighborhood just as much as it's anybody else's neighborhood. Um, you know, like I said, we live there full time. I mean, they'll go to um, uh, Lachlan Design uh, in, you know, a couple years when they get older. And I mean, that's, you know, what will be for the next, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, our lifelong house, you know, I don't, and so, um, but I, I tell you what, um, you know, just kind of speaking on, on what I've seen, and especially with the guy earlier, uh, I feel so sorry for him because I feel like he's been put through the ringer and, you know, his property has been blasted all over, you know, the news and website because you can't control what someone else, you can't control anybody, you know, especially some tenants that you have, you know, in your um, property. And I think the proper thing to do with that would be to contact the police so the police can, you know, do something immediately as well as, you know, even, and the property owner and he could speak to them as well. But I tell you what I can do. Uh, because this is my home and I don't want bachelors or, or, you know, bachelor parties or bachelorette parties destroying my house because once you get, you know, 10 guys or 10 girls or something, mine is more targeted or marketed for or would be for families. Like I said, they're two years old. I still have cribs, you know, so it's, it's marketed for families. I don't want my house to be destroyed. What I can do is properly vet the people who I um, choose to uh, accept to rent uh, my property to, um, you know, so, uh, I mean... 
And as far as, uh, you know, the council member, I don't, I mean, I know I don't know him. I've never, you know, tried to introduce myself to him or anything like that. I, I didn't really know that, you know, that's something that I should do or, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I definitely want to be involved in my community, but I mean, you know, I, you know, it's a, a different point. And then another thing too, you know, I, I just that I've kind of witnessed there from the back. I mean, there's people here who want to try to oppose this or, or whatnot. I mean, you know, people that I don't know, like I don't, why, you know, what kind of, you know, hatred do they have, you know, towards me or what have I done to them? You know, I mean, I don't, you know, it's just, that's just, I mean, it's kind of. Robert, is there opposition? Is there opposition for this? Okay, there is. Um, yes, we'll hear from the opposition and then you can come back and respond to what they have to say. Okay? okay. So let's bring up the opposition. Please state your name, your address, and why you're in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Logan Key, and I reside at 1411 Fatherland Street in uh, District 6 of East Nashville. Uh, I do, by the way, uh, my home uh, does touch the 600-foot uh, radius that was required to get a notice in the mail, which I did receive from uh, the zoning administrator a number of weeks ago. Uh, that is my address. I'm also vice chair of the Coalition for National Neighborhoods, which advocates for the interests of uh, neighborhood uh, quality of life and welfare uh, in Nashville. Uh, and, and for the record, I do have uh, no hatred whatsoever for um, the appellant or for uh, short-term rental operators in general, or for anyone else for that matter. Uh, I've, got, I've got two concerns that I want to express um, and that I think are, are worth your consideration, uh, particularly in the context of uh, the rebuttal that will be made by the appellant in just a moment. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to address uh, the notion of not knowing that a permit is required. I do respect uh, the fact that not every uh, person, not every citizen, not every property owner uh, can stay fully abreast 100% uh, of the time regarding uh, the nuances of the zoning code. Uh, but I do want to uh, point out the fact that according to the most recent uh, warranty deed that was uh, registered by the Register of Deeds of Davidson County, uh, this property most recently uh, sold on July 7th of 2015. Now that would have been after the short-term rental regulations uh, went into effect. As I recall, the short-term rental regulations uh, were debated uh, uh, in the latter part of 2014, and, and I, as I recall, the original ordinance was, was passed in the very early part of 2015 uh, to become effective on July 1st, 2015. Now, originally that was in Title VI for the most part. There was one clause in Title 17, but Title VI is where the bulk of the, uh, of the uh, STR regs resided. That was later moved into, into Title 17, but the point is, uh, as I recall, the short-term rental ordinance uh, as it originally existed, uh, was passed in law by the Metro Council on July, uh, to, to become effective on July 1, 2015. This property uh, was uh, most recently sold here again, uh, signed off on July 7, 2015. That would have been uh, a period of time after the, a short period of time after the STR regulations not were passed by the council, but actually went into effect. Now, well, but the applicant said that he didn't know. Well, is that I guess, relevant? I guess the question I have sure. on this is that I, I, I do think it's relevant, but I think I, I'm not sure it, it would tilt the scales in his know, we favor. We don't doubt that he's under our jurisdiction and that the law was duly passed and all that, but he just said he didn't know, so that's well, not much of a. Ed, so can I address that? Yeah. Can I address his the ch Mr. Chairman's confirm, uh, concern first? Uh, I, I think one uh, lens through which it's worth looking at that, just suggesting that it's worth looking at that, is that. We, 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 we typically, uh, as far as I know, don't, uh, 
make that excuse, for lack of a better expression, uh, for someone who buys a piece of property and, and claims that he or she didn't know how it was zoned. So if I, if I buy a piece of residential property and then uh, I suddenly want to operate a commercial business on that property, uh, if someone came to you uh, appealing that, they might, you might have jurisdiction over it. I would doubt that it would uh, prevail upon you to, to give someone a pass and, and uh, operate uh, a business or operate uh, any kind of operation well, against the, the base zoning. We, we don't have that authority. The Metro Council does. Okay. So I would suggest you look at that through the similar lens. The accessory use for short-term rental uh, was codified, effective in July. Uh, I think that would be tantamount, not to a zoning change, but uh, a modification of the zoning code uh, such that it, it became legal and became accessible as an accessory use uh, by the applicant. Yeah, I mean, you know, I T tell me, I guess there, there's a couple questions. One is he's testified he didn't know, and, and frankly, unless you have some evidence that, I mean, you, you're saying that you think he had to have known because he bought the house afterwards, um, after the law, and or it, it was discussed, and, and he, it was a time when he had known, and yet every single time, every single case, day we have these cases, we get more and more people that don't know. I've been to community <laughs> meetings in my own neighborhood, of people who I've considered to be extremely well versed in what's going on in the neighborhood, and I'll talk about BZA cases, short-term rental, and they're like, "Well, I can have that without a permit." No, you can't. What? Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there is as much as as the activists that, uh, and well-informed people are that that come here regularly and tell us, "Oh, everybody should know, everybody should know, everybody should know." They don't. But and so if you, if you got proof, you don't know. Tell me. But the behavior is, he rented it twice. Over a really short period of time, I mean, is there, is there, is there, do you have any evidence that there was longer spread violation or that what he has is, no, is not true? No, absolutely not. And, and then have, given, have no given, evidence whatsoever. Right, then given, given that, then, you know, we have, we have the responsibility to decide, well, what's an appropriate penalty? He, he, you know, he's admitted that he rented out without, without a permit, so we know that that's the case, but we have, a, we can decide on anything from nothing to a year. So tell me what you think should happen to people like this. Well, that that um, that that rented for that that had ten days worth of violation, rented twice, immediately tried to go fix it, and were told that hey, you you know, you're in technical violation. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me uh, make it clear that I don't uh, I don't suggest to you that he knew. Uh, okay. I, I I do take him at his word for that, and 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 certainly would expect you to do uh, that as well. Uh, should he have known? Well, I would argue that that he should have known, and any other property owner should have known to the ex to the same extent that one knows how a property is zoned when they purchase the property. Uh, I know it's nuanced. Uh, I know that short-term rentals are an accessory use. It's a variation. Uh, it's a it's a corner case, if you will. But I would argue that any property owner should should understand I mean, at least in principle accessory they, use in the same way. They should, but they don't. Property owners are more interested in square foot and number of bedrooms and bathrooms. They don't get into the What's it zoned for? Well, <laughs> Most well, of the time you buy a house, that doesn't come up at the closing, usually. Uh, well, I would, I would suggest otherwise, uh, particularly if uh, a property is being purchased in order uh, to uh, develop it or otherwise uh, make money off of it. For example, uh, developers all the time will, will contract for property. Those uh, are developers. There's no evidence that this person here is a developer. Uh, he wanted to use it as his personal residence, heard about Airbnb, then decided to use that. That, uh, true, but I, I would still uh, press the case that, in, in general, one should be uh, familiar enough with accessory uses uh, not to be uh, categorically granted uh, the the least penalty possible uh, based upon uh, a, a violating operation. If I could press one more case, and, and this uh, is actually, I would argue, more piv more pivotal, more pivotal than everything I've said so far. I, I would, I would the, the notion that he should have known that a permit was required uh, secondary to the following point. Uh, I, I'm a little confused by uh, 
who he is, and I think you ought to, to make sure that it's clear, and he's on the record stating that he owns the property. Uh, and, and let me point something out. The application for short-term rental uh, describes the parcel owner as Monty F. and Pamela G. Stewart. The applicant is clearly uh, Mr. Stewart, who introduced himself earlier, Montana Stewart. Uh, I think it's worth asking him if he is one and the same as either uh, Monty or Pam Stewart, whose names are listed on the deed as the owner of the property. Now, I printed this off just earlier today. I'd seen it some time ago, but I waited until today to make sure I had the, the very most up-to-date piece of information on uh, the Metro website. And I'll be glad to submit this for the record. It's the warranty deed. It was registered by the Register of Deeds on July 9th uh, of 2015, and it, and it states that the property was conveyed to Monty F. Stewart and Pamela G. Stewart, husband and wife. That may very well be one and the same as Montana Stewart, who's sitting behind me and, and will speak to you in rebuttal, but I think that's worth asking him if I could submit this uh, for the, the record. That's really not an issue here. Uh, we much as it wouldn't be within our purview to determine what kind of permit he may or may not be applying for. We're just here to to determine the item A issue. Well, so I would argue that he would not be entitled to a type one permit per the code. Well, that, it, that's a whole other issue. That's not something that we're deciding. We're not deciding whether he should have a permit. We're deciding if the actions of the administrator were appropriate or not. Okay, and so I would encourage you to, to entertain the notion of whether or not the applicant is the owner and uh, would therefore uh, even be subject to a uh, Type 1 permit. And I think that ought to be established on the record. And that's the second point that I wanted to make, and, and uh, that's all unless you have questions for me. Questions for the opposition? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please come back. Mr. Chairman, from staff, just in case it helps expedite a potential rabbit hole here, um, the question of ownership of the property is contemplated at the time of an application for a permit. The board need not make that determination here because an application would determine at the staff level whether it's appropriate for a type one, type two, or type three permit application. Meaning our great Metro staff has done the vetting and it wouldn't be in front of us if it wasn't the real owner. Or more to the point, regardless of what the board does, if the board were in fact to say, fine, go get a permit a month from now, a minute from now, a year from now, whatever, that is an analysis that our staff members will go through at the time of application. Here, we don't even get into that because there was the preliminary issue of operation before obtaining a permit, whatever type of short-term rental permit. Therefore, because of that threshold issue, it made its way straight to the board before having to go through those other questions. Okay, with that being said, we're not gonna talk about names and ownerships and nicknames. So what do you have to say? Look, the point is, I bought the property to live, for, for my family to live in the property. Point being, that's why I don't know any of the legal terms or lingo or um, zoning or anything. Like I said, it was, it was, it was a house for my family. I fell on some uh, unfortunate circumstances. I needed a source of income, an immediate source of income. There's not really too many options out there where you can ha you know, find an immediate source of income. Um, this is just, um, this is just a, um, a, a stepping stone. It's just a, um, So know. let me ask you this. What did you learn about this process uh, that you've now been through and sat through these hours of meetings? What have I learned? Yeah, what you learned? Well, like I said, you know, um, especially, you know, from the previous case, uh, to, to, to uh, extremely vet or properly vet who your tenants, you know, will, will be or who they are um, to help reduce some of the nuisance and um, noise complaints and things like and that. Oh, Oh, and well, and and it, I guess if you're just speaking in my mm -hmm. instance specifically, um, I, I, f I followed all. Once I found out that I like I don't, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I didn't know. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I don't have cable. Um, I don't read the newspaper. My my source of news comes from like Yahoo. So if, if you know if Nashville's uh, short-term rental permit, you know, made national news, I would have known about it. But you know, other than that, I just didn't know until I spoke with a friend and I was like, hey. You know, I listed my property um, on sure. Airbnb like you, and then he was like, well, did you get the permit? And I was like, you know, what permit? So he, he explained everything to me. I was, in, I was, uh, had followed all steps, was in compliance, and actually there sitting at the, the, the gentleman's, all, uh, you know, at his desk when the, when it popped up, when the yeah. violation popped up. 
and 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 then once again after that you know properly followed all steps uh, in accordance again uh, but like I said this isn't I don't I, I mean I don't see I, I can't make a, a a full you know career out of this okay. like I said this is just a stepping stone and I'm just trying to do what I am, am supposed to do legally or or, or you know okay. officially yep. you know through you guys okay. just I mean very good any other questions are you Montana and Monty Smith? You one in the same? My, well, my my full name is Mon Montana, but my friends call me Monty. I He's mean, I'm just asking. Yes, okay. Sir. Anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Yeah, yeah, oh, well, let's hear from Mr. Osborne. Mr. Osborne, you got a complaint about this. What did you did you investigate? Did you find any noise complaints or anything like that? It was just a unpermitted complaint I received on August 29th on August 31st I went to post my stop work order um, it I sent an abate notice that same day with a uh, so inspection date of September 21st he beat you down to the codes office or I guess you beat him at the end of the day because it got dinged before he got his permit I suppose that's how it worked um, but um, after posting my stop work order is still p online until about September 13th but he had came into compliance by September 21st, so I had closed my my case against it, and now we're here to see okay. what y'all's ruling will be. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? I do. You said he applied September 21st because no, he applied uh, August 31st. Uh, my reinspection date was September 21st um, for the posting of the stop work order and the him operating without a permit. Um, okay, so the reinspection date, you, what do you do? On I, I go and check to see if it's still online, if it's still advertised, if it's still operating. And, and it was it or was it? It was not. Was not, okay. Anything else to add? No. Any other questions? Okay, close the public hearing. Discussion. Council, so, council member said it, this, he thought it was clear cut. He said he thought their neighbors had some concerns, but the council member thought it was clear cut. It, Seems pretty clear cut to me, too. Well, I would agree with you. Anyone want to have a motion based on clear cut? Well, I could um, make a motion based on um, sort of the format we used last time, which is um, uh, moving that the zoning administrator did not err. Um, and we'll assess a three-month penalty from the date of the application, which is August 31st, uh, which means the date for reapplying for the permit would be November 30th. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Discussion of the motion. I prefer a two-month penalty, but um, he wants to. I feel like last meeting we sort of settled on three months for but these. Every cases. case stands on its own. Oh, well, I agree, but this is this is sort of what we came up with. She says three. For, uh, for these types of cases, which are similar that they don't know uh, about the ordinance. So the question the, is when the three starts would start. When would that It would be? start from the date of the application, which is, which is August 31st. Okay. So if it was two, it would almost be. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, to me, I think that some of that, and again, my, my rule of thumb is, is the reviews and, and the how, number how of cases, and he took it down immediately. I mean, we certainly had people that have had, you know, 25 reviews that didn't know and certainly understand that. Uh, and, and some of those, because of the time delay and and how they got on the docket, you know, we're already at two months. So, you know. To me, I'm thinking this is more of a two month, would you? Okay, um, I'll withdraw and you guys can um, redo the motion if you'd like. Um, I'll, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err um, in denying the short term permit um, and that applicant will be eligible to apply for a permit two months after the application date, which would make that uh, October 31st. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Does I need to withdraw my second word? Yes, I mean, technically, yes. Withdrawn. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Yours is withdrawn. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
passes unanimously. So the applicant is eligible to apply October 23rd? 31st. 31st. You can talk to them and bring them that same application. Do not rent, do not post, and do not do anything until you have a permit in your hand. Okay? Thank you. John Mike. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2017-278, another short-term rental case. This one from Laura Clifford, the appellant and owner of the property located at 713 New Hall Drive, shown here on the zoning map in Council District Number 6. Uh, this is the challenge to the denial of a short-term rental permit, the denial having been predicated on the failure to obtain the legally required permit before operating a short-term rental property. The aerial photo shows the subject neighborhood here, face of the property from the tax assessor's website, despite being dated. That is it. So, Ms. Clifford, if you're present, please come forward, introduce yourself to the board by name and address, and make the desired presentation. At the outset, we will ask, is there anyone here planning to speak in opposition to case number 278? Seeing none, you'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Press the button and pull the microphone closer. Now, is that good? Great. I'm Laura Clifford, 713 Newhall Drive, and this is my daughter, Celia Hughes, who I asked to come forward because I don't hear real well and she might need to help me hear. Um, this is a similar case to the one you just heard. I started the thought of having using my small guest room for Airbnb in May, and I had not even heard the term short-term rental at that time. I was thinking in terms of a small business license and knowing that I wouldn't make over $10,000 that I thought I didn't need a license. So I started with Airbnb at the end of May, and then shortly afterwards found out that Oh yes, there is a certain there is the hotel tax and the short-term rental license. So, so, so how did you find out the oh yes? Where where did you find out that basically there's um, laws? A, a friend who's also Airbnb and uh, she was here earlier, but she had to leave and she has she's licensed and she's she's the one explained to me that hey you know. And what was your response to that? Oh gosh, well I'd like to be on the right side of the law, so I'll go apply for my license. Think never occurring to me that I'd be denied because I just naively assumed that they would ask me to pay the back taxes and give me my license, sort of like a driver's license. If you're late applying, you still get your license. You might get fined, but you can license. So I jumped through all the hoops, which took a while. Um, so it was August before I went in and applied. Part of that was because the post office lost one of my certified letters and I kept waiting and waiting. But anyway, he, I was denied and um, told that I could, you know, come to uh, appeal it here or wait a year and reapply. And so as I was thinking about that, which route I wanted to take, um, the notice appeared on my door and was shut down. So anyway, I'm here to, um, not, this is an explanation, not excuse. I should have researched it and known better, but I didn't, and I'm asking for grace and forgiveness are you, are, to Are you a native Nashvilleian? Um, well, I've been here 30, 40, 50 years <laughs> so, since college. Oh, wonderful. So tell me this. Um, did you have to cancel any of your postings? Ten. And did you have to pay a fine for canceling any of those? No, they didn't. They didn't find me. So how did you do that? Did you call them or did you email them? I have a representative with Airbnb, and mm -hmm. I contacted him, and and he. And what did you say? I said I'm being shut down, and I have all these people who are expecting to come stay at my place. What am I going to do? And he assigned me a case manager, mm -hmm. and the man case manager found notified all those people that it was canceled and found them new a new place to stay, which I really appreciated. Okay. And did not find me the $50 yes, they occurrence have the, that they might have. They could. They, they could did. have, but they chose not to. Okay. And what did you learn from this experience? Uh, I learned to do a little research and uh, make sure that I know what I'm doing instead of making assumptions. Okay. Questions. Then, when, when did you when did you stop renting? When did when did uh, what date did? August twenty eighth is when I stopped. Okay. So you were renting one room in your house or two? One room with for a private, fifty dollars. For fifty dollars a, a night. night. Yeah. Okay. 
Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? That's about it. Okay, thank you. We're gonna hear from Mr. Osborne. So Mr. Osborne, you know the drill. How did you find out about this? And there, have there been any other noise or other complaints besides not having a permit? No, just that they did not have a permit. I received the complaint August 17th. Um, as you all know, I stay very busy with this. I didn't get out there until August 28th to post my stop work order, at which point it looks like her advertisement came down relatively quickly thereafter. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, thank you. Um, let's close the public hearing and discussion. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just have, I personally have empathy with folks trying to do the right thing. I just do. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think that this is a case where uh, as soon as it was determined that there was a violation, uh, it, you know, the activity ceased, that everything was canceled, trying to do the right thing. And so I'm, and I'm, Please, I, I'm, I would be willing to make a motion unless you think, again, uh, there was some discussion a minute ago about. Every case is different, make your uh, motion. About penalty, but I'm happy to make the same motion I made before, and that's that the zoning administrator uh, did not err, and that the uh, applicant would be eligible for a permit on October 28th. Okay, the motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. So ma'am, you will be able to reapply and get a per apply and get a permit on October 31st? 28th. Oh, 28th, okay? So go and get your permit. Thank you for being here and being honest with us. Mr. Chairman, with case number 281 having been approved on the consent agenda, that brings us to case 2017-284. That case involves the property at 2202B, 24th Avenue North. The appellant, Joseph Pryerson, is also the owner of the property. The request for before the board is for a variance from sidewalk requirements. This is a zoning case, Mr. Chairman. The request is not to build a sidewalk or to pay into the sidewalk fund as required under the modified version of the Metro Zoning Code as part of the construction of a single family residence. The property shown here highlighted on the zoning map. The aerial shows the applicant someone, can come forward. If Mr. Frierson would come forward and take the seat. Good day, sir. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the aerial here shows a now dated photo of the property. The site plan submitted with this case already in your packet gives a sense of the proposed layout of the construction project. Face the subject property, the view up and down the street in its current condition. We'll note, of course, there is, in fact, no sidewalk along this section of 24th Avenue North. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 284? There is one. Therefore, the appellant will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Sir, if you wish to save any of that time for rebuttal, it will come out of this original 15 minutes. Uh, please introduce yourself by name and address and address the board. I'm Joseph Frierson, 2118th Avenue South. Joseph Frierson, 2118th Avenue South. <coughs> Excuse me. I do apologize to the board, Mr. Chairman, for being outside on the phone call. But I would like to appeal to the board uh, concerning uh, section 17.20.120, uh, provision of sidewalks, and the in lieu of contributions forced upon small landowners such as myself. <clears throat> According to the condition set forth in section 2C of, of the provision of sidewalks, Sidewalks installations are not required for the property located at 2202B, 24th Avenue North, Nashville, Tennessee. Along with the statement made by an employee of Nashville Planning Commission that there are significant challenges to installing a sidewalk at this location, I have other instances where these challenges come into play, but not exhaustive list. One, if installed in the pedestrian right of way, the finished Planning Commission suggested alternative sidewalk would be 23 feet 
from the front door of the existing structure on the property. Two, the finished site suggested sidewalk will remove the possibility of using the much needed existing off street parking at the front of the existing structure on the property and therefore will not facilitate safe and convenient pedestrian movement. Three, the forced in lieu of fee of the provision of the sidewalks ordinance is greater than 6% of the building costs for this particular project. So who's saying all this? I am, sir. Okay, yes. Okay, I thought some metro person was. Okay, continue. No, sir. The metro person did make the recommendation that there are okay. uh, challenges to putting so in the sidewalk. But which metro? Someone from planning? Because we have a very different um, recommendation from planning than what you're describing. Yes, sir. I will see from Mr. It's a Peter from the planning. Uh, this was quoting from an email. Mr. Peter? I'm sorry, Peter, he doesn't give his last name. And, and I'm not a sir, by the way. But what is his Ma email address? <laughs> is it a his dot email natural address? Dot gov email address? It's Peter Bird from planning. Peter dot okay. Bird at okay, yep. Okay, yep. okay. Uh, and he said in his email, Metro, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It looks like there are significant challenges on the property to building the required sidewalk and grass strip. I was curious if you have looked into the feasibility of building an alternative sidewalk that is consistently five feet in width, or if that is something you're interested in exploring. <clears throat> so he admits that there are significant challenges. But he's also saying you should build a five foot yes, sidewalk sir. instead. Yes, sir, and I agree. That is he, just, so do you want to build a five foot sidewalk? And with, even with the five foot sidewalks are mm -hmm. in built in the pedestrian right of way, it is only 23 feet from the front door of the existing property. I'm building a house in the back side of the existing property. <coughs> Excuse me. Keep, you're keeping the existing yes. house? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's zone R6, and we're putting a single family house on the back side of the existing property. Excuse me. Three, the forced in lieu of fee of provision of the sidewalks ordinance is greater than 6% of the building cost for this particular project. And the cost percentage will increase with lower square footage housing projects planned for similar properties on 24th Avenue North. I also own three other lots in which I intend to build affordable housing which is much needed in Nashville, with that this. I'm always curious when people say affordable housing, so how much are you considering building houses and selling them for? Uh, actually, sir, I will not be selling them. I'll be building them. Renting them, okay. Yes, sir, renting them to uh, people coming from. So just roughly, and this doesn't really have anything to do with Roughly how, how much, much it would cost? A month, a month. How much can I rent from you for? If you, these are planned, you could rent these for about eight ninety nine hundred dollars mm -hmm. because that would make them affordable. And if I build these at that rate, maybe I could build them for 100000 each. Okay. And then I could rent them at that. But with this but cost. Your, but one of your arguments, I guess, to us is you don't want to pay into the sidewalk fund because it increases your cost. It increases my cost and because sidewalks aren't required to be installed on this street. So actually are under our new metro sidewalk ordinance. Well, the ordinance that I was given just the other day states that in item C, public sidewalk installation, the provisions of this subsection apply to all property frontage regardless of whether sidewalks are provided in public right of way or pedestrian easements. One, construction of new sidewalks is required along the entire property frontage under any one or more of the following conditions. Unless the property abuts a sidewalk segment that the Department of Public Works has funded and scheduled for construction. A, when there is existing sidewalk in need of repair or replacement, which there are not. B, to extend the existing sidewalk or sidewalk proposed by an abutting development, which there are not. C, existing sidewalk present on the same block face, which there are not. So this property does not meet the conditions in which there are sidewalks should be installed or required to be installed. No, the, the code actually meant if one of those applied, then you couldn't, then you wouldn't be 
have to under certain circumstances. Then you will not have to? Yes. John Michael, help us out with our newly passed sidewalk ordinance and is this property required? The ordinance at issue is BL 2016-493, which was passed in April of 2017 and took effect on famously on July 1st of 2017. The zoning staff member that reviewed, uh, reviewed this case, Mr. Thomopoulos, applied the law appropriately, determined that sidewalks are required at this address, but that the applicant is eligible to make the payment to the in lieu of fund uh, for the sidewalk requirements. The appeal is based upon the desire to build nor pay into the fund, which is, of course, perfectly reasonable and an appropriate appeal to bring to the board for their consideration. So uh, he's required to build sidewalks under the law. On the law, it, it are required to build it. Yes, okay. that's why you're mm -hmm. here asking us. Okay, well. So questions of the applicant. So you mentioned that if you built the sidewalks the way planning wanted you to, it'd be 22 feet away from your house, is that what you said? 23 feet away from the front door front of the door. existing house. And that's bad because of because the proximity of the front door and because there are there is off street parking that if this sidewalk is built they would not be able to use that without being parked on the sidewalk well we're not we don't allow cars to park on the sidewalk and that's what i'm saying but there there's an off street parking there now okay we do have a letter in our packets from Eddie Latimer, who's the CEO of Affordable Housing Resources, and he's asking us to uh, waive this requirement based on affordable housing um, and the kind of size of this house. Any questions? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? Oh. Oh, there's opposition. Yes, come forward. You will be back after this person speaks to rebut. So please come forward. Sorry. Please state your name, your address, and why you are in opposition. Okay, I'm Leah Festa at 2314 24th Avenue North. And, and so how close is the house? Do we have a map, John Michael? Okay, do you, is your... So I'm south on 24th, just a couple of blocks, three blocks. No, not... Can you see your house in this picture? Um... But you're on 24. Yeah, I'm very close. I'm just like right underneath. Okay. There. So um, why are you here? So I'm here, first of all, I'm fully in support of affordable housing. And after hearing him speak, it makes a little more sense because I did want to understand what's going on. But even up our street closer to my house, in between his house and mine, is, there's so many new houses going up. And I feel like they're all applying for variances. Um, and perhaps it is going to be affordable housing. I don't know that that's guaranteed. I just don't understand why they can't. Um, why they can't pay the in lieu of fee. Um, and a lot of times they're buying a small lot for very cheap and putting two houses on it and making an insane income. So I just, it's not clear to me why they need the variance. And I also think we're right next to the public housing, uh, the projects over there, and there's a ton of children that walk down our street all day long. Um, so I think they're trying to get to the bus stop in the park, and it's a very busy street, and there's cars that go very quickly, um, which is something I'm talking to my district councilman about. But I just, I, I didn't think that it was necessary for him to get a variance. Yeah. So. Questions for the opposition? No? Thank you for being okay. here. Thanks. Hear from the applicant again. Come back. So this rebuttal time, um, respond to what one of your neighbors said. Yes, I do agree with what she was saying about the buying up the lots and making out with a bunch of cash. But in my instance, that's not so. I've owned these lots for over 17 years, uh, paid taxes on these lots for 17 years, and I have no immediate plans to sell these properties once I do develop the affordable housing. So I do agree with her as far as the investors coming in, buying up these properties, because at that point, the sidewalk variance only become a line item for them. But for me, it becomes a, uh, as a small 
individual investor, it becomes a burden uh, in order to provide the affordable housing because therefore the $10,000 per lot that's gonna cost me to put in the variance or pay the in lieu of, uh, I have to put that on the, uh, within those rents. And so if I had to put $10,000 on every affordable housing, then that does push me more and more higher, higher with my rents. So I do understand what she's saying, but in my case, uh, that really would not apply because I'm not looking to sell these in the near future. Okay, any other questions? Nope, thank you. We're gonna close thank the public you. hearing. You understand it, but you don't agree with it, correct? Beg your pardon? You understand her position, but you do not agree with it. You don't agree with her position, your neighbor? Um, not as it pertains to my case, because I'm not buying and selling. Now, I do agree that there are need for sidewalks, of course, but this road, 24th Avenue North, is such a narrow road now, if sidewalks are to be installed, that would make it more hazardous because of the narrow, the narrow road. Now, as far as her concern, I'm, that's a true and real concern, and I don't totally disagree with um, not paying the variances, but with my plan or moving forward and owning the property for 17 years, the variances do uh, come into play for providing affordable housing. Okay. So, we, it, I'm sorry, it, it, I'm a little confused about the drawing. Are, are you putting, you only have to put a sidewalk on one frontage, it, is that correct? Or do you have- At this point, yes. Just on one front, okay but it will come into play with the other three lots. Okay, any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank We're gonna you. close the public hearing. Discussion, so this is a new one for us. We have a letter from Affordable Housing Resources, and the main argument is I'm building affordable house housing, therefore I should be in, um, out of the sidewalk fund or build sidewalk, and also that the street would be kind of hard to navigate. That's what he's saying. Well, I'm sympathetic, but that's a legislative item, and if Metro Council wanted to exempt affordable housing projects from building sidewalks, then they would have done that, and we're here to rule on whether or not there's a topographic or other kind of hardship. Um, that clause, that Bill Herbert clause that David always mentions, and I don't know that affordable housing fits under that category and how are we to determine what is affordable housing? And I do think there is a safety concern for children. We've heard testimony that children walk down this road and um, so I'm in favor of building the sidewalk. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think affordable housing, uh, generally speaking, I think most urban planners would tell you are, are in need of sidewalks more than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand that it adds an additional uh, financial burden, but again, uh, you know, if, if that's if the, the the purpose of the sidewalk is one of the main purposes of, of a sidewalk le of the sidewalk legislation is to help people uh, in lower income areas uh, to get to mass transit, for instance. So uh, I, I agree. I, I think that the sidewalk should be uh, should be built. We also had some testimony that in this neighborhood or on the street, there are other potential developments coming up, so it's not like the sidewalks to nowhere cases that we talk about. Anyone have a motion? I will. I'll move to deny the variance request and that the sidewalk um, be constructed to Metro standards. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Mr. Chairman, just for the board's consideration, this was a case where the property is eligible for the fund, so um, the board can can right, they vote can. how it votes and it will the likely fall to the, in this scenario, would fall to the developer's option before the permit. The person always has the option of paying into the fund. Not always, but mostly. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree to pay into the fund, so my motion stands. Okay, our motion stands. Hold on a second. Wait, so, so John, Mike, let's. But, but he's uh, on. But the variance is only asking for relief from the in lieu of fund. Right. So. Yeah, so 
or the, building the building seeks to neither build nor pay. Oh. The law allows right. him to pay in this circumstance, and he's looking to get out of both before the board. So if, if the, the motion is to deny the, the variance, and it's up to the developer to choose to either build no, or... No, she's very specifically saying no and lieu fund build the sidewalks. Right. It, but I don't, I don't think we can tell Let's him that he can't do that. I, you, I think because the law allows him to either build a sidewalk, sidewalk or pay into the fund, he has to, I don't think that y'all can override that ordinance. Um, with res I think you can say his appeal is denied and he has to either build a sidewalk or pay into the fund, but I don't think if the law specifically allows a particular piece of property to do one or the other, I don't think that y'all can override that. Does that change your motion? Yes. I guess it has to, unfortunately. So I'll withdraw the last sentence of the motion. So your motion stands as now what? Um, motion, motion to, to deny. deny. Okay. Unfortunately. And the second is agreed upon, yes. Okay, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposes. Passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, the next case to come before the board is case 2017-285 because case number 286 involves the adjoining property and a similar project for development. Be happy to present these cases together. Naturally, the board would still need to take up the vote on those two cases separately since they do involve slightly different requests. The appellant for both cases is Jody Roberts, representing Ewing Holdings, the owner of the two properties, 641 and 643 Vernon Avenue in Council District Number 20, just not too far off Briley Parkway. The request in case number 285 is for a variance from buffer and fence requirements, height restriction at the front setback, and height restrictions at the northern lot, at the northern lot line. This is in the RM20, or um, Residential Multifamily 20 District, to construct two duplexes and one single family home at the lot shown here for a total of five units. The site plan submitted for 643 Vernon Avenue gives an idea of the proposed layout for the residential construction in question. For case number 286, which is a request for a variance from front setback requirements and height restrictions within the R8 district, and that's right, those two lots are zoned differently despite being side by side in the middle of the street. Uh, the request there for the two duplexes, one single family residence for a total of five units, again as referenced. The site plan here shows a proposed layout. From my recent site visit, the undisturbed land as it presently stands, the view directly across the street in the upper left hand corner and then the views up and down Vernon Avenue from the subject property. Is there anyone here in opposition to either case 285 or 286? Seeing no one, the appellant will have the opportunity to make the desired presentation to the board. Uh, Mr. Garrigan and his client will address the board, have 10 minutes to do so, 10 minutes per case if need be, and if that is not the case, that's of course okay, Mr. Garrigan. Okay, thank you. It's been a long day, so I'll try to be brief. Um, there's a little bit of uh, maybe some clerical stuff going on on these two, but I'll, I'll try to summarize it up in a nutshell. The, the northern lot, which is 643, is owned RM20. It permits five units. That's what's, excuse me, I'm sorry, Michael Garrigan, Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. I should know better. Um, okay. I was trying to jump too fast. Uh, the northern lot is zoned RM20. It's permitted five units by its size, its acreage, and that's what's proposed. The southern lot is R8. It's a duplex eligible lot. It, it's permitted two units, which is what is proposed. Um, the, the first variance that applies to both cases is that we're requesting is there's a landscape buffer required between R8 and RM20. Uh, since we own both lots, and we prefer to develop both lots as a cohesive development and have one shared driveway between the two as opposed to two driveway cuts, two segregated developments. Um, that driveway is going down the center where the landscape buffer would be, but we would be buffering and fencing our property from our property, so it really didn't make a, a whole lot of sense there. Um, and then the, the second variance request is for the height standards on the RM lot. The R8 lot is okay because it's permitted three stories. The RM20 lot uh, is 30 feet at the setback. We're slightly above that, but that's for simple gables. Coming up, I, I've got a how, architecture. How slightly? Um, I can, if, if you don't mind handing that over and passing that around, you can see it's orange on this. I don't know if that was part of your packet. Um, but I, I will also, I will also um, point out that we did meet with uh, 
the Robertson Road Neighborhood Association last Thursday night and Council A. Roberts was in attendance. And I have an email here from Fred Pickney, who is the president of the association. Uh, and it reads, it's addressed to MCR, which is Mary Carolyn Roberts. Good morning, I just wanted to follow up and let you know that we voted in favor of supporting this variance request. Thanks, Fred. Um, so the neighborhood is in favor of this. Again, the, the, and the council person is as well. And the, the, two, the two specific items we're requesting is the landscape buffer down the center that we've, we've talked to Stefan about, and I think everybody agrees is, is not necessary. So really the main one is, I would say, is the height variance that you're seeing now, but it's only for those gables. It could be removed and there could be a hip roof there, but the neighborhood agreed with us that they like the architecture better with the gables. So that's it. I, I will point out one other thing that there was a note on uh, case number 286 that refers to a setback variance for the R8 lot, um, which since the time these applications were filed, we've since it's been updated in the in the Kiva City Works. I don't even know what we call it anymore. System um, that has removed that. As so, the, the two variances are the height on the RM20 lot um, along the eastern and northern property lines, and the landscape buffer. And then the buffer and the fence just have to. What is the fence? It would be right down the center of the property. Okay, but, that's, but the buffer the, it's, the that's just the fence between the two. Correct. Yes, not not yeah. any abutting properties between the two. And the urban the, and the forester uh, had to leave. But he, I know he didn't have any issue with the buffer. And he did ask me to say exactly that, Mr. Taylor, that he had no opposition to that request for the variance on the buffer issue. Questions of the applicant? Anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. We will close public hearing discussion. We are going to discuss both of these cases, but we will have separate motions. So council met with the neighborhood association. Council person's fine with it. No opposition. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it seems like, you know, I had, when I, I wrote down, you know, four variances, you know, right. question mark, exclamation point, what? And then you, you, you get to the case, you're like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, I, it, I think that, that uh, the, the height variance is, again, it's, it, it seems to be aesthetic and neighborhood uh, compatibility, which, uh, you know, I think makes a lot of sense. So. I'd, I don't really have an issue with it. What do our architects think of this? I'm easy with it. <laughs> I'm easy with it. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion? I move we approve it. Okay. <laughs> Well, do we have to send you to BZA school? Where do you approve? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Our, our, oh, okay. Thoughts? I'll, I'll move one at a time. I'll, I'll move that we approve the uh, variances for 643 Vernon Avenue. Uh, because all of the conditions under section 17.12.020B, 17.24.240B, 17.12.020B, and 17.12.020B, that sounds like there's a lot of repetition, but uh, it's listed on the application, <laughs> have been met. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. And I'll make a motion that we approve the height variance for 641 Vernon Avenue because the conditions set under section 17.12.020A, note number four, have been met. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second that one too. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion?
Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case is number 2017-287. Benjamin Vaughn is the appellant and Cap Holdings, LLC, is the owner of the subject property located at 201 23rd Avenue North. This is in the edge of Council District number 21, just off West End, not too far from the Central Sportsplex. The zoning map shown here demonstrates the MUGA zoned property. The aerial view shows the property in, its cur in approximately its current condition. Uh, some sidewalks in place at the present and the commercial establishment having been there, of course, for a number of years. The request before the board is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in this, the MUZ, MUGA zoning district, uh, in conjunction with the construction of interior renovations to the existing building. From my recent site visit, the view of the property from the street corner, the view caddy corner across that same street corner, then the view up 23rd and down the cross street demonstrating the condition of the sidewalks that are presently in place. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 287? Seeing none, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. To be very clear for the board, this is a request to neither construct the sidewalks up to the current standard as codified at 2016-493, uh, the new sidewalk bill, nor to contribute into the sidewalk fund. Okay. Uh, Before we get started, John Michael, this is a little bit different than most of the sidewalk cases we hear. This is not new construction, it's renovation. Could you tell us when and why the sidewalk new law gets triggered? It applies to this case. I mean, at risk of just exhausting the whole discussion, and council may be able to reread every subsection of the law that applies here. In staff's review, it's determined, yes, it did trigger the sidewalk requirements here. And um, the appeal, of course, is perfectly reasonable to bring before the board. Is there any just on which construction um, projects th does? Yes, it says the cost of any renovation equal to or greater, greater than 50% of the assessed value of the structures on the lot. Gotcha. That's what I wanted to hear. OK, thank you. Let's go. Good afternoon, I'm Benjamin Vaughn with representing Cap Holdings and I have Dr. Cornelia Graves and Manly Seal with me. And the reason why we are trying to uh, avoid having to uh, reconstruct the uh, or modify the sidewalks is basically for the provision of Article B on uh, the ordinance of BL 2016-493, which indicates the cost of any renovation equal to or greater than 50% of the assessed value of our structures on the lot, et cetera. Uh, the assessed value of our building is $2.5 million. And our project is projected at 740,000. So that does not So where did you get the 2.5 million from number? Uh, Manly Seal with Powell Architecture and Building Studio. Uh, I looked that up on the uh, one of the website, the not like works. a Zillow website, huh? Like a like the Metro website. Yes, yeah, the Metro website, and there okay. was a, an assessed value. Um, it has okay. the purchase value too on there, but then it also showed the assessed, the most recent assessed value okay. of two point five million. Yes. And you have quotes to say that the work that you're doing is seven. Yes. Yeah, I brought yeah. that. It, and and I say at the time. Uh, you know, this, uh, the, the ordinance was, you know, as, as stated previously in some other uh, previous hearings, uh, went into effect in July. And so we were unaware of this ordinance when at the time of uh, permit um, submittal, and, uh, and they certainly were unaware of this ordinance uh, at the time of purchase. They purchased the property in May. Um, and so as you, I think y'all said that the, the, the council had passed the ordinance in April, but did not go into effect until July. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, when we got the comments uh, back from uh, codes at the uh, sometime mid to end of July, we kind of started researching the issue. Um, and at that time, I think both the zoning personnel uh, and public works personnel were a little bit confused. It was new to them, particular in the case of interior renovation. Uh, and so they're recommending us to go to the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. And at that time too, we were we were unclear of this B um, provision. Pr provision. Um, so anyway, through, through weeks and months of research, we've now have, uh, are clear that at a time, if we had known this provision and were clear on what that meant, we would have brought this up way back in July. 
to a uh, question, do you, you we're only talking about this part, this section of the sidewalk that kind of touches your parking lot and touches the street, right? You already have one of your part, one of your sidewalks has the grass strip. Is that sidewalk at play too, or is yeah. it just the one well, that's? The way that it's both, Mr. Vice Chairman. Yeah. Based upon the planning's recommendation, they specify the recommendation for 23rd and for Brandau, which is the property shown here toward the left of the screen, and that's 23rd toward the lower okay, right I, of the screen. I want to stop here for a second and ask our council about this. If if they're disputing the, or, I'm sorry, are you here? I'm sorry. Uh, if they're disputing the the valuation of the property or how that was determined, would that not be an item A appeal? Well, I don't know that, uh, I don't know if, but, if the zoning I mean, administrator would be the one to determine that or if that was the, yeah, I guess, actually, yes, I guess it would. If that's what they're disputing there, th and he, that's what he based his decision on, then I think it's the probably on, I mean, if, if, they're, if they're correct in the value, then the point is moot. If that we're discuss the variance is moot. I mean, there's no need for it. It would be an item A appeal in that scenario, Mr. Harper, because it would be disagreement with the zoning staff's determination of the applicability of the ordinances drafted. So it would still give these folks an opportunity to be before the board and seek the relief they ultimately want in this case. It would just be couched as an item A case rather than a variance case. But, but we, if, we, if we voted on the variance today to their satisfaction, then it would, they're settled and they can go away. But if they, if they, if it's not, no, no, I'm gonna go away like I want you to go away. It's been a long day. But, uh, but if, 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 if we voted in, in a, in, on the variance and they didn't like it, then couldn't they come back at an item A and say we shouldn't have been here in the first place? Or it's, it's a whole different issue. We would advise them to seek counsel and <laughs> make that determination. I mean, I'm saying, would it be eligible for them? Would they be eligible to come back? And not that they should, or I'm not I, telling them they should or shouldn't. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm wondering if, do they lose that option if we hear it as a variance case? Mr. Chairman, I may be able to eliminate that question by running back to the office, pulling up the assessor's website, and pulling up the two key numbers in play here, the assessed value and the appraised value, which are two very different numbers for every piece of property in Davidson County. Sometimes we have folks that come in and report a large number to us referring to the value of the property, and it is, in fact, the appraised value, which speaks something closer to market value, whereas the assessed value is the much lower number that the assessor uses in order to uh, uses the baseline in their calculus for Do the you year. have those numbers? Yes, I can speak to that. We purchased the zoning the administrator may as well, Mr. The Chairman. Assess, right? yeah. We purchased the building, the appraised value we purchased for was $4.2 million. So what's the assess? Do you have those sheets that well, show the assess value? Uh, well, when I printed off, I actually did not show the assessed value, so I, uh, I wrote it. Uh, I don't know why I didn't, but, it's all, but it, it was $2.5 million what I read. It's the assessed value from the National Plan Department website where all well, that information I mean, is. since, Chairman, uh, respectfully, I mean, since that's sort of the, the, the hinge of here, why, why don't, can we, can we heal this case for? And let John Michael go, and so if we, if John take Michael break, goes, then we have recess. to take a break, so, okay. Recess? Can we do that? Or can we, it's, you could more readily just table this case for a moment while we seek that resolution, start the next case, keep on trucking, and bring back an answer at the end yeah. of whatever the next case is. Okay. Lest we be here till 10 o'clock. Okay. Yeah, I think if we table this, then, then we can come back to so it what we're gonna as do soon as he is, gets the information and it may help you out. Okay. Delay this, he's gonna find that, they're gonna find the information, so come back, let's go back to the audience. And John Michael, will call the next case. Mr. Chairman, the next case that will be called to the board, I'm not sure if I've seen the appellant here today or not, it's case number 2017-290. The appellant is Gong Su regarding the property at 1305 Grand Avenue. Is Gong president? Oh, I'm here on behalf of, okay, very well. The appellants are present. This, uh, Mr. Chairman, has been presented to the board couched, I think, as a motion to rehear, but in actuality, a new site plan has been submitted on a prior, a previously heard Board of Zoning Appeals case involving the property at 1305 Grand Avenue, shown here on the zoning map, and here from the aerial photo. This is now an active construction site. 
Um, because of the changes to the site plan previously submitted to the board, it was regarded as being sufficiently different from the prior case that it need not come forward as a motion to rehear, but instead as a new zoning case. So they properly filed the appeal for case number 290, paid the fee, and are now with you with the request um, for a variance. I've used the same photographs from my original site visit back in the late summer. We'll allow the appellant's representative to introduce himself by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board for case number 290 and its variance request. What are, what are the variances? Do you know? Okay. <laughs> and th this is the one that the council lady had asked us to... This is Councilman O'Connell. You do have an email from Councilman O'Connell. I believe that's in your packet. It came in a bit late. And I'll, was, I'll, I'll read it for the please. everyone. John, I specifically encourage the applicant to reach out to the community, and now I'm hearing that he has made no effort to do so. I would now encourage him to defer, or for the board to defer, so that he can explain to the community what he explained to me. Councilman Freddie O'Connell, Metro Councilperson, District 19. So here we have a request to defer from a Metro Council person. And out of a case that we just recently heard something on the same property, but now it's different. Well, I was under the impression it was a motion to rehear today, so I'm not ready to hear that case. I guess it's not really <laughs> up to me, but... Um, well, you could make a motion to defer. Okay, yeah. I'll make a motion to defer then um, one meeting to allow the applicant to speak with the community per the councilman's request. Second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion? John Michael? Does that give so you enough we, time? We, we've made a motion to defer one meeting and it's been seconded. Respectfully, I would recommend two meetings based upon the fact that this was originally thought to be a motion for rehearing. Therefore, as I understand it, no new notices went out to the community, so there's nobody that even knows that this case is on the docket today. As a result, we strongly recommend getting out the legal notices. You can work with our staff as early as tomorrow morning if need be, and we'll be happy to help point you in the right direction on that. Moving in at least those two meetings gives everybody a fighting chance to be more directly engaged in the process. And District Councilman Freddie O'Connell is kind of in the busiest council district as far as building, so I'm sure extra time would also be helpful. I'll amend the motion to be two um, hearings. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Deferred for two meetings. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, as the zoning administrator continues to work on the previously tabled case, perhaps we can move on into the next scheduled case. Yeah. It's going to be case number 2017-294. Joseph Conrad, the appellant and owner of the property located at 823 Horner Avenue, shown here on the zoning map, just off 8th Avenue South in the Melrose area, has filed a request for a variance from lot size requirements uh, in the art. I'm sorry, John Michael. I'm sorry. Did 292 get deferred? Nope. I just skipped right by it accidentally, Mr. Harper. <laughs> Blew right by it. <laughs> sorry about that. No problem. As I was saying, Mr. Harper, case number 2017-292 is the next case we'll present to the board today. Mark Wright is the appellant and owner of the property. This is located at 2127C, 14th Avenue North, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements in the R6 zoning district for a residential construction project. The site plan, or the aerial view shown here, gives you a sense of the layout there at 14th Avenue North. The site plan demonstrates the proposed construction. From my recent site visit, the view of the active construction project underway in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street in the upper left. And then the views up and down 14th at this subject location where there is the request for the, um, the request for the sidewalk variance. Mr. Wright, is, uh, Mr. Wright is present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 292? Seeing no one, Mr. Wright, you'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Just introduce yourself by name and address and have at it. All right, thank you. Mark Wright, 2127 14th Avenue North. Uh, this is a little different of case. Um, there is an existing sidewalk that is presently there. So what they're requesting that I do, and I talked to Mr. Ed Coase, Stephanopoulos, 
if I pronounce his name correctly, and he agreed with me as well. They're asking me to put a four foot vegetation strip behind the existing sidewalk and then do another sidewalk behind that, which will put that sidewalk 17 feet from the front door of our house. So I think the confusion is that this kind of rule was in place if there isn't a sidewalk, but there is an existing sidewalk there. So if I was to construct this new sidewalk, it would not uh, be in line with the current sidewalk that's going completely up 14th Avenue North. So, uh, and we have to also install rain gardens, so this wouldn't work if we install this new type of sidewalk, being 17 foot from the front door of the new construction, we wouldn't have any room to put our rain gardens, which is required by codes in the front yards uh, of these townhomes. The, the planning um, staff I had written down said that they were okay with the variance for the sidewalk, but they requested that you pay the MLU fee. Is that something that? Well, we're going to go ahead, you know, doing construction, we have to repair the sidewalk anyway, so we're going to have to redo that existing sidewalk. Why do you have to repair the sidewalk? Well, doing construction, you have to, when we, doing, when we cut the, uh, for the lines, sewer lines, we have to cut the sidewalk, and so we have to go back and repair it. And if you're doing that, why don't you just build the sidewalk to standards? Well, that's the confusing part. Well, if you build the sidewalk the way they're saying, it's, it's a four foot vegetation strip, then it's the sidewalk's behind that strip, which is 17 foot from the front door. That means the other sidewalk, our sidewalk basically do this. Here's the existing sidewalk, here's the existing sidewalk. Our sidewalk will go in like this and close to our front door of our property. Yeah, we, we have had <laughs> cases like this in the past where there's ways to deal with that design-wise and it's too bad someone from planning isn't here to explain that, but um, there are ways to deal with that transition. Okay. We've had this kind of question. Sure, but planning is also recommending that we approve with the condition that they just and leave. <laughs> leave leave the sidewalk where it is and and, and pay the inlu fee. <laughs> but the applicant does not. Well, we don't have to. When I say repair, we don't have to tear up the entire sidewalk. Just the section that we cut up. Any more questions of the applicant? Anything, oh, oh no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything else to add? Well, I just want to add that this, of course, uh, to meet the standards of the variance, it doesn't provide any hardship or injury to the to the public or to neighbors. Uh, and uh, combined with the creating this, uh, the state. The but what is your hardship to not pay into the fund? Well, I don't see a need to pay into the fund since there is a sidewalk there. Uh, to pay, I can see if there was no sidewalk. But we have new rules that say sidewalk should be built this new way or pay into the fund. That's what the law says. Build to the new standards or pay into the fund. But the new standard says I put it 17 foot from my door, which doesn't make sense for that particular street because there's an existing yeah. sidewalk. And that's, that's why, why they And that's why there's that or pay into the fund. I, I just don't understand the paying to the fund when there's a sidewalk there. So I'm paying an additional $8,000 when I already have a sidewalk. And Public Works is responsible for actually doing the sidewalks. So I'm already being taxed, in the beginning I'm being taxed again to pay for another sidewalk I already have. It doesn't make any sense. And aesthetically wise, it, it, I just think that, the, like I say, when I talk to codes, it, to them it didn't make sense for me to put this rule into play with this new type of sidewalk, but to leave the existing, so I'm axing do not stall and do not cont contribute because there is an existing sidewalk there. So it doesn't make any sense for me to yes. pay. It's not and the way the law is written. The law is written that right. you either build it or you pay into the fund, and that's the way the law is written. Right. That's what I'm asking for the variance today. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Anything else to add? No. Okay. Thank you. Close the public hearing discussion. So here's an interesting one that we've heard a few of before. Hey, perfectly good sidewalk here. Well, that's we, yeah. What you said? No, that's all. Yeah. Well, but, but I think what Public Works is saying by recommending they pay in the frontage is so if Public Works does come through, let's say, on the street, 
and build a new sidewalk, they will build it to the new standard and that's what the money's for. And they're saying, you know, if a sidewalk weren't, weren't there, it would be build it or, and they probably would not be recommending the in-lieu fee. They would say build it, that's it. So, I mean, I, I understand the frustration of the owner, but I mean, that, I mean, that is, that's how we're, that's how the city has chosen to fund sidewalks in the city. And it's kind of like one of our previous people that was just saying, why should I build a sidewalk? But that's what the law says. And the law was passed by the Metro Council, might I add, unanimously. So, that's what we have. Well, and, 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 and I do, I, I do appreciate how it feels like a, a, a an extra burden in tax because it does, it does feel that way. Um, but I do think that was the spirit of the council's ruling. I mean, I think that was their choice. And you know, well, the appellant has the option of not paying the Enlu fee and yeah, ripping right. out the existing sidewalk and building it to the standard. So he's not, it's not like he's no, no, no. So I mean, I, I, I definitely get <laughs> but he it. He disagreed but with how that was. Sure. Built. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I understand the point, and I, and I think. I understand his point of view. I just think it's counter to what the, the law says now. The law is a new law, and, and that's what we're dealing with with a lot of the, the cases that we have. Yeah, his issue is more legislative. It's not what's before us. So is there a motion? I'll move to, um, I guess, deny the variance request. For the sidewalk. For the sidewalk, um, and the applicant will well, we'll either have the choice to pay the in lieu fund or build a sidewalk to Metro so standards. I think I'm just denying it. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case we'll present to the board is the previously break. referenced. Oh, we need a break. Oh, quick break for the board. We'll reconvene. an accurate determination of the assessed value of the property, not the appraised value, but the assessed value of the property, which is the trigger under 2016-493, the presently applicable sidewalk ordinance. Um, as the document, I think, was passed around a while ago, the zoning administrator worked with the office to confirm that the assessed value of the property is $370,200. Not the appraised value, but the assessed value. That is the value based upon which the taxes are determined. What's so obviously, that this is a, beg your that, pardon? When does that get reassessed? That, that was done in 2017, so just this year. Of note, the, the property was previously used by a nonprofit entity, or rather owned by a nonprofit entity, and therefore its assessed value showed as zero. However, this, since this is no longer owned by a nonprofit entity and is assessed regularly, just like any other commercial property, the new number is $370,200. So obviously the cost of the renovation project greatly exceeds 50% of that number, and therefore the sidewalks are in fact triggered. However, the good news for the appellant is they have filed exactly the right variance request to seek a variance from those requirements. They'll then have the opportunity to demonstrate their case to the board as to what hardships they have, such as would potentially justify the sidewalk variance that they seek, you, of course, have a recommendation from the planning department in your file. Um, the appellants have the opportunity to introduce themselves again by name and address, and we can reconvene with their presentation. Yes. I'm a Dr. Cornelia Graves, and I have with me Benjamin Bond, who is the business manager, and uh, Manley, who is our um, architect and our builder. I actually represent Cap, our, I'm the president of Cap Holdings, but actually the, um, we purchased this for our medical practice, Tennessee Maternal Fetal Medicine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a maternal fetal medicine practice is a high-risk pregnancy practice, um, and we get patients from all over, from as far as Alabama, Kentucky, and West Tennessee. The reason that we purchase this practice is because for convenience for our patients and the ability to park near the building. The sidewalk, as you can see, the building does have sidewalks, but if we place the, the sidewalks as as noted, uh, we would have to take up many of our parking spaces, which would make us probably very close to not qualifying for codes for parking. But also, it would make a very it would make a hardship for our patients, many who have heart disease, diabetes, and 
really don't need to walk that far in to see a, um, a, a provider. Um, and for this reason, we'd like to um, make an appeal for the sidewalk ordinance as there are sidewalks present and we would really not like to reduce the number of parking spaces that we have available for patient care. Do you, are the, is the parking lot, do you know if the parking lot's entirely on your property or is it? Uh, yes. Well, the, yeah, so just in that red uh, boundary is the parking. You, the, the, the picture showed it as if there was more parking behind the building. That parking yeah. is not. No, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I drive by, the, I go to the sportsplex uh, to play tennis uh, okay. quite a lot. So I drive by this building uh, once or twice a week. Um, and then I saw the zoning sign. It's like, oh, oh goodness, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to see see the see the folks that have this building. Um, so yeah, that's what I, I wanted to know. And then I know that in the other picture, uh, I, I know that the, the the street that has the grass strip is quite a. a, a it actually is a really pretty street in that section, and there are a lot of mature trees, especially in the grass strip. That uh, to me might uh, warrant a, a hardship of expanding that and. Well, also let me speak to that street as well. I mean, there, there is also, so not only the, the mature uh, trees that are there, but there's also some existing retaining walls and the elevation of the site there, it would, you know, to get, I mean, just that, to see that one tree there would have to probably go to meet the requirement. Um, and so there would be, it would be quite extensive work on that street. So that's the retaining wall also in this picture or part of it? Uh, the left one is on 23rd. The right picture is uh, it's on Brando. Yeah, and the, I'm sorry. I, I would say that the, over, the overhead picture uh, that, that we had, uh, like I said, I've been been going down this street many many times for many many months, and uh, I've never seen it that empty of cars. I don't know when that overhead picture was taken, <laughs> uh, but there there uh, I know your parking lot's full, but the. The, the sidewalk here at least has parking, which is almost always uh, full on the street, which frankly acts as a security buffer for pedestrians on that, on that piece. So I, I do appreciate that piece of it. Planning um, recommends paying into the in lieu fund. Do you want to address that? Um, our practice it sees about 45% Medicaid. Uh, patients and so by us having to pay into the fund that would create a hardship one is being able to finish the building and modernize it so that we can see patients and two by uh, contributing the cost to expanding the sidewalk on Brando we would lose parking spaces as Dr. Gray's alluded to and as a result that could cause a potential hardship to those patients and um, there could be a problematic situation with the patient as such. They could have a medical situation. So essentially, um, from a financial standpoint, uh, we are trying to, uh, we're trying to make certain that we uh, use all our monies uh, to modernize the facility. And because, this, the, uh, just as the picture shows, there are sidewalks there, and they're in pretty good shape, and parking there is at an absolute premium. Any other questions? Anything else to add? Mm. No. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just add one more, just re to reiterate the parking issue. I mean, the, right now, uh, I believe the required parking uh, is around 23 spaces. Um, I believe there's approximately 32 spaces on the uh, site, but we would lose probably, you know, that whole row along. Brand out, which we, so we would probably move it to not being compliant with the parking requirement. Um, and you said what? You said you bought you bought the building in the summer, and what? We bought it in May. May. We what, did you, May. What, was, what did you pay for the building, or is it? We paid four point uh, four point one five million approximately. I mean, it, it, it's public record, but I just was curious. Yes. I didn't want to get the business, but it, it it does impact my thinking on that. Okay. Anything else? Let's close the public hearing and discussion. This one bugged me when I so because I pass it a lot, and uh, you know, and mainly because the, you know, if, if it's somebody's front yard, uh, you know, or, or there's green space and it's you're able to move a sidewalk, uh, 
but you know, this building's been there a long, long time. The parking lot's been there a long, long time. And to, to come into compliance, you're asking them to basically give up the land that they're using that's critical for their business. So I, you know, I, I, I have a tough time saying, hey, it's okay to do that, although I think that may be uh, what the law says. But the, the other piece of it is it seems like while we're definitely here because it meets the letter of the law in terms of the value and assessed value, uh, it seems like there's a timing disconnect between the assessment and the current owners and that if this were a year from now or whenever that reassessment yeah, happens, it's, it's and for somebody to pay $4 million for a building and put 700000 into it yeah, to, to, me, to yeah. trigger, I mean, it, it just seems like it's it's very unique. And they're not, you know, like tearing it down or adding all these new things. It's well, uh, yeah, I mean, like other cases. So to me, you're right. I think if there was a kind of the, the appraised value was based on what they recently bought it, it would be different than, you know, commercial real estate, particularly in this area of town has just skyrocketed. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm inclined to just, to, to support a variance with no Well, do you want to ma make a motion? And, I mean, I, I will move to see see how it goes that we uh, approve the sidewalk variance um, and that the applicant is not required to pay the MLU fee. Okay, motion's been made and I'll second it. Um, any dis pro uh, motion's been properly made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, our next case is 2017-294. This involves the property at 823 Horner Avenue in the Melrose neighborhood, Council District Number 17. Joseph Conrad is the appellant and owner of the property in question. The request is for a variance from lot size requirements in the R10 zoning district for the construction of a second single family house on the property. I would note that although there was opposition present previously, uh, like a lot of folks, that individual had to leave. So that individual chose to write down a simple expression of the opposition. Mr. Chairman, do I understand all the board members have had a chance to review that? Yes. You are already aware of other letters that have been sent in in support of the matter, yes. and the board can take up the matter with a hearing or any other motion they deem fit at this time. I mean, if if a, if a fellow board member has information or, or feels based on the new addition to the packet that it should not go back on consent, then I'm happy to hear it. But otherwise, I would be happy to move that we put this back on consent mm -hmm. uh, since the neighbors support it, the council member supports it, and certainly respect the the fellow's uh, points, but feel like that they may not be relevant to what we are hearing today. Sure. Okay, motion to put it back, on, has been made to put it back on consent and has been properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously, back on consent, approved, you're done. Sorry, we can't give you back your Four hours, but you know, uh, you may have had you may have had a, you had all that time to have a spiel, but you know, <laughs> staff will compliment Mr. Lefever on the very capable lawyering that led to this good outcome for his yes. client. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2017-295. It involves a property at 1504 Arthur Avenue. Anthony Owens is the appellant and owner of that property. This is an item A case challenging a short-term rental permit denial based upon the fact that the applicant had in fact operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit. Subject property shown here at the intersection. Slightly closer up front shot of the property. Uh, Mr. Owens is present and will have, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 295? Seeing no one, sir, you have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourself by name and address. Anthony Owens, 1504 Arthur Avenue. Uh, I've been operating uh, since uh, September of 2014 and I was under the wrong assumption that uh, own, owner occupied uh, didn't need a permit. Did so, you say you've been operating for three years? Uh, we we started, uh, I guess before the, I guess the boom hit, and uh, you stayed under the radar screen for three I, years. That's why I didn't, I didn't. That's why I thought it was we were we were I guess grandfathered in or something. So I didn't know anything about having a, a so, needing a permit. But we finally 
got around to figuring this out. So when did you find out that you were operating uh, a permit? And it, it had to be August, or was it September? I just came home one day and there was a, like a, a tag on my door with a duct tape. Uh -huh. Well, the so, little hang tags. Nah, -uh, it was. I guess oh, it, it was plastic. On, it was okay. pla yeah, plastic on the front door. And did you rent a lot? Because I don't. I only have in my notes. I only have eight reviews. So is it? Did you rent a lot more than that, or what? How many often? Yeah, we, uh, yeah. You must be looking at um, something else. Maybe I yeah, have it wrong. Yeah, looking at something right. else. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I mean, eight. I mean, three years, and nobody said anything. Yeah, that's why I thought it was. Yeah. That's why I thought I was. I was good. Mm -hmm. uh, so when did, so I'm assuming in District 19. Yes, so, and I'm uh, a, also a uh, officer in my neighborhood as well, so. Okay, so how come you didn't know? I, just ignorant of the rule, I guess. Watch I watched, but like I, I always kept hearing non-owner occupied. So since we lived there, uh, that's where I came, that's where I came under the uh, wrong assumption. Okay. So I thought on occupied, and I was doing. So, did you have any future rentals when you uh, got the lease? Uh, it has had one. And what happened to that person? Uh, they were able to take it off and find them something else. And how did you do that? Did you contact? Uh, yeah, I, I contacted Airbnb. And what they say? They said no problem. We'll look. And what did you tell them when you contacted? I told them that I don't. I didn't have a permit, so I came down. And then the one thing that I didn't do was I thought they would unlist my listing. Mm -hmm. But I had to unlist my listing, so you, I, it's down. It's, da it's down now. Yeah, okay. it's down now. Okay. Any questions for? So, what did you learn from this process? I can't. I still can't uh, believe this I, is one of those. I learned that I need to. Years. I learned I need to read the uh, fine print a little better. <laughs> yeah, uh, Airbnb does not have it very clear on their website. No, it does not. And uh, I've been to two or three meetings down here. Well, it's been uh, not for not for these type of meetings, but there Maybe. were there were short-term rental meetings down here dealing with. Uh, I guess it was. I guess it was like people lining up against it or for yeah, it. Uh -huh. And yeah, I never heard. I never. The whole time I was here, everybody was talking about non-owner occupied, non-owner okay. occupied, and I, I would always leave. So I guess I should have stayed to the end of the meeting. Okay. To hear what happened. Okay. Any, any questions? No. That um, I know Bob's not here, but. Um, he did leave some information. Okay, let's hear it. My understanding from um, Bob is that he had sent an abate letter to this particular property and that the um, property did not come into compliance with that abatement, within that abatement period, and so there's an environmental court case pending against this particular one. Well, that's just what I just, that's what I was just saying, that I had to go in and take it off the okay. listing myself. I thought Airbnb took it off when I canceled the existing reservation. So regardless of what we do, he's got a court date in front of the environmental court. He does have a court date in environmental court. Unfortunately, I don't know when that is. Um, okay, well, that's not but, it's, but it hadn't been heard yet. It's, it's November the so 4th. November the 4th. Of course, no, the bad November news either is, the 1st or the 8th. and for those watching on Metro National Network, is um, we get to decide whether someone is punished a year for operating without a permit. If environmental court finds you been operating without a permit or in violation of the law, it's three years. So. Um, with would, that, Mr. Chairman, with an early November court date, the first certain BZA meeting that would follow the court appearance would be the November 16 BZA meeting. That would give the court the opportunity to make their determination based upon the allegations of noncompliance with the abate notice that was sent according to your packet on September 1. I think we should go first and maybe that will <laughs> help the court with something. It will help them dismiss the case, assuming that you've made a determination on the uh, notice to a violation, but that is, of course, not what you're making a determination on right. today, speaking frankly in terms of how that's been handled in the court in the past. Okay. We're hearing it as well. Okay. Anything else to add? No. That's so I'll good. ask you what everybody else, what have you learned from this process? Uh, I've learned that uh, I don't want to be involved in this process anymore. I've learned that I need to make sure that uh, if I'm allowed to do this, that I uh, apply for the permit, which I've already had. Mm -hmm. So when I went in, they said, well, you know, you can't get the permit because you have to go sure. to you. So I learned I have to make sure that I follow it to the fine letter of the law. Okay. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. You know, this this case amazes me just because someone could operate in District 19, which is, is one of the most popular sites, and for three years and not get a notice. But I guess we're busy. So.
question, I mean discussion. Anyone have a motion? Oh, don't all go at once. <laughs> he does have two letters of support. Okay, yes, I noticed, and yeah. uh, let's, let's talk about these letters of support. So there are some neighbors who bothered to write us in support of you know, this case. I think that's always helpful. You know, like I said, it's just still just. And I have spoken with the. Yeah, the public hearing is okay. this part closed. Um, so, you know, and so, you know, somebody really likes you because they wrote a letter to us, a handwritten letter, and the handwriting's a little shaky, but at the end it says, please excuse the writing, but I am 77 years old and recovering from a stroke, and she still wrote a letter for you. I need to know who that is. <laughs> Margaret okay. Gilbert. So, um, so, any motions? I'll, I'll move to um, let the zoning administrator did not err, and that we assess a three-month penalty from the date of the application, which was September 14th. So that would put it out to no, um, December 14th when he can apply for a permit. Okay. I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. This is what we ruled on December 14th. Not now, but December 14th, you can you are eligible to apply. Did you say November or December? December. Okay, December. You are eligible to apply for a permit. I would work with the codes department because it's more important, this environmental court thing. And so I would... Yeah, this, really this doesn't get you out of environment. No, I, no, I, I, I will go there. I'm going to talk to Coles tomorrow, and then I will make sure I'm and in I would ask them about yes. how to deal with environmental court or okay. ask some lawyer. Okay? All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. John right. Michael. Case 2017-298 is the next case to be presented to the board. Providence Builders is the appellant, the owner of the property as well, located at 1428 11th Avenue South just at the edge of the Edge Hill community. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements there in uh, Council District Number 17 at the R8 zoned property. An old photo here shows the aerial. Single family construction proposed for HPR development. The intersection here at Argyle and 11th South shows the property as, as depicted in the uh, site plan from my recent site visit, active construction site well underway now, and the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner. Then the views up and down 11th from that property as well. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 298? Seeing no one, the appellant will have okay, 10 we, minutes to make the desired I do want to read in at the beginning, we have a uh, email from the councilman Colby Sledge, and he says of this case, there's a quote, I'm against this request, the appellant has not spoken to me. There we have. Please hello. start, identify yourself, your address. Okay, hello, I'm Frida Bartlett, um, representing Providence Builders 1211 Martin Street. Um, if it's possible, I'm just gonna kind of read over this of letter. Course. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, dear board, um, the reason we're requesting a hardship variance for sidewalk installation on the property located at the corner of 11th Avenue South and Argyle Avenue is due to the physical and unique characteristics of the property, more specifically the top topography condition. Um, the nature of the slope of, and of the grade of the site, and there's also rock and everything, you'd have to basically clip into the grade and install a small retaining wall. Um, the condition of said property will result in uh, practical difficulties or undue hardship upon the owner of such property. The specific conditions cited are unique to the subject property and generally not prevalent to other properties in the general area, which can be seen via a visual inspection, Google Maps, or the pictures, well, I actually had pictures of the site itself. Um, building sidewalks in accordance with the zoning will require substantial grading and the construction of a retaining wall amongst other construction on the property due to erosion control and the safety of the proposed dwelling and of the sidewalk feature that will be required. Okay. Um, so, topography, any questions for the applicant? Well, and, uh, just to note, the planning 
uh, sort of broke it apart for the Argyle frontage and the 11th uh, frontage. And, uh, they, they recommend approval uh, with the condition that the applicant, applicant pay the in lieu uh, fee for the Argyle frontage and that a modified sidewalk would be acceptable to them uh, on the 11th, uh, which is with no grass strip, thus minimizing how far back into the site they would have to go. Have, have you seen that from, have you? No, I haven't. And I, I I honestly have kind of a question about like what they would actually require if you know if we were to do that or whatever. But um, just to clarify, just a little bit of something on that. The Argyle side, there's already an existing sidewalk, and we do agree upon construction. You do have to repair that and to make it up to coast. That was not you know in any issue. I, I would assume on our part, it was the 11 side, which due to the fact that there's a crazy slope and everything, and the the grade of it, and you'd have to clip into it, and it would kind of as far as structurally, it was not only just encumbering the sidewalk issue, it's the, the, the home itself and whatnot. That's, that was kind of sort of our issue. But if there would be like a varied sidewalk that wouldn't go into the setback as far and do all, you know, still become a, a usable sidewalk, then we would be for that. But like if you were to look at the whole thing, there's not a sidewalk at all on 11th at all. And thank you for this. Mm -hmm. Questions of the applicant? Which street is 11th on this on this view? The 11th is the side of the house. Okay. The Argyle is the front of the house. Right. And just rule of thumb, Argyle has the sidewalk. <laughs> 11th has a curb. So our, we're seeing that Argyle has the sidewalk? Yes, and 11th has a curb. So if, if I understand what planning is, is suggesting, which sounds like a good deal for you, they're saying leave the Argyle sidewalk the way it is. I mean, the way you found it. <laughs> and then they're saying for the 11th frontage that you, they, they want a sidewalk, essentially uh, with the sidewalk on the curb, no grass strip is what they're saying, but build a sidewalk. What, like, I guess it's kind of confusing because well, we have to basically get a structural engineer to make sure that this sidewalk, because of the topography of, of the landscape, right. if you see the area, it was it's like a giant slope. So we were at, trying to figure out if we would have to get like an engineer to go out there and to make sure that this doesn't you know go too far. And I do understand their reading this now. I do understand their consideration of no longer requiring that grass strip, which would be helpful. Um, so. So are you okay with the? I kind of want to understand more what they're actually asking for. Like, does an engineer need to make sure that this is, you know, structurally sound, or can we just get our, our can we just get our civil so we'll just go ahead and give them a, a modified si sidewalk plan, which we've done before. Well, it, you, I mean, it just says an, uh, you construct a sidewalk with an alternative design with no grass strip. Okay. And I, that you would. If you just worked with them with planning to make sure that they were okay with it, I mean, it. We don't have to give. We don't give specifics. We just say you have to build a sidewalk on on 11th, and it has to be a modified sidewalk with no grass strip. That well, sure, that you as long as it's out. modified, yes, we can work something out with planning. And if and if it comes, so, so. I mean, if, if you end up with a topographical hardship, then you come can back. still come. I mean, you can <laughs> say, hey, I need to, you know, I I can't work it out. Gotcha. Right. I mean, I was also going to say you have the option to defer the case if you'd rather speak to them before us deciding. Well, my last question would be then if I was to speak to them before deciding or whatever, and if they say, okay, yes, whatever you just submitted, it's fine, then I wouldn't have to come to the next meeting, or how would no, that go? Have, you'd have to come back. I, I think you'd, 
I mean, if we if we vote on on this, then yeah, that's yeah. Right. If we don't vote, then you're gonna have to come back. But if you if we do vote, then you have to go work it out with them based on what they've recommended. Okay. The, the two options. So what are we gonna do? Do you so, want to defer or do you want us to vote? Um, go ahead and vote. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, okay, um, we're gonna quote. Anything else to add? Um, no. Okay, no. we're gonna close the public hearing. I like her decisiveness. Yes. <laughs> Just vote. <laughs> I want to go home already. Well, and I, I'll I'll move that we approve the variance with the conditions from the planning commission that say. Um, on the Argyle Street frontage, they, uh, they, they think that was that just to keep the, the existing the sidewalk the and, and uh, paid them for that uh, small strip. And then on the 11th side, the, the applicant would construct a sidewalk with an alternative design with no grass strip to address the site's topography that uh, the applicant can work uh, with planning on to make sure that they're okay with that. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Sure. Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. John Michael. Good. Mr. Chairman, the final case to be presented to the board today was originally scheduled to be on the consent agenda. It's case 2017-299 and involves the property located at 2156 Murfreesboro Pike. Brad Bork is the appellant for 2156 Associates Limited, the owner of the subject property. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in this an R10 zone district and also a commercial planned unit development along Murfreesboro Pike. The aerial photo here shows the property in question and the business that's in place there, which is a self-storage business. The site plan submitted gives a description of the layout um, with regard to the proposed project. From my recent site visit, the view of the subject property includes the small retaining wall, the view up and down Murfreesboro Pike in the lower portion of this slide, and then the view across the street in the upper portion. Again, this was uh, recommended for the consent agenda based upon the fact that it was determined that no additional testimony would be required necessarily in order to grant the approval. However, as you'll recall, the district council member had some questions, I think ending with, I don't know if I would determine that to be a hardship or not. The appellants are here to demonstrate their argument to the board for the case. Uh, please introduce yourself by name and address. You know, Given this the was empty the case room, I assume there is no opposition. That Representative Karen Johnson spoke out against uh, at the top of our meeting. I, I, and I guess I have a, a question. I mean, the Planning Commission had recommended that we approve it with the condition that a sidewalk with an alternative design is constructed as shown on the approved site plan, and you all were good with that? I mean, I, and I think that there was some confusion as to whether the council lady had actually seen that, which I understand and understand our commitment to sidewalks, but it, it seems like that there's a, a you can tell us what you want to do. So, to be clear, you haven't spoken with your council person. That's correct. This. My name is Randy Harper with Perry Engineering, 100 North Main Street, Suite F, Gillettsville, Tennessee. Uh, I also have Brad Bork with me, uh, same address, Perry Engineering. Um, can you just get to what the hardship is? So we es essentially, the hard hardship is uh, we've got on the um, I guess it's on the uh, south side of the property there. We have an existing bus stop, uh, fire hydrants, some rather large uh, NES, steel NES poles, uh, some uh, traffic signal poles related to the traffic signal at the, the neighborhood just south of the property. Is the bus stop on your property? The bus stop is in the right of way currently. But in, you know, next to your property? Yes, it's, it's in front of our property, okay. yes, sir. And we, we've actually worked with uh, or had discussions with MTA. We're actually relocating the bus stop as part of this alternate design, relocating it north uh, of the driveway. They want to actually move it further away from the traffic signal. So with the, with the alternative design, we're moving it north uh, at their request. Okay, it looks like you uh, got a pretty decent plan here. Anything else? So, um, let's close the public hearing. So I, I will, I'll, I'll be David Ewing for a second and the lesson here is <laughs> talk to your council person if you're gonna ask for a variance. And I'll make a motion that we 
uh, grant the variance uh, based on the revised site plan drawing submitted uh, entitled sh uh, sheet BZA site plan C-2.1. For the alternative which is design. the which is the recommendation of the planning commission, right? Yes. Then I'll second, I'll second that, second. or unless you want to second. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Right. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank We're you. done. The next BZA meeting will take place on November the second, twenty seventeen, where we will hear our three hundredth case. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.